the streets in which Terry is working. And to you, sir, specifically because we are really enjoying working with you and your ministry. Thank you uh, for your support. Always, like we fully depend on you and your support when you we value your support. His Excellency, Mr. Vincenzo Di Luca, Ambassador of Italy to India. Uh, sir, uh, of course, you know Terry much better and Terry is enjoying uh, your support all the time. So we would like to acknowledge that and thank you so much. His Excellency, Mr. Ugo Astuto, Ambassador of the European Union to India. Uh, really speaking, in spite of the pandemic, I'll put it this way, you had taken trouble to come to India, uh, to Terry, and discussing with the colleagues, with the youth, so and so therefore, your full support to Terry and youth is to be uh, acknowledged by all of us in Terry. Thank you uh, once again. Uh, for those who don't know Terry much, I'll also like to take a couple of minutes to introduce ourselves. The Energy and Resources Institute, Terry, it is an independent, multidisciplinary organization. Uh, it's a not for profit research organization. But apart from research, we believe that research shouldn't remain confined to the four walls of the lab. And therefore, we do a lot of work on policy, consultancy, implementation, and so on. And it has pioneered conversations and actions in the field of energy, environment, climate change, biotechnology, sustainability space, and so on. In 2024, we will complete 50 years. So we have 48 years young organization. And we have a twin focus, as I explained, on research and outreach. And one really, I'll put it this way, that this particular thought-provoking initiative of Youth Climate Conclave is well received by my colleagues in Terry, and they are fully, they are so enthusiastic about implementing the same. The program is uh, basically a competitive and educative mode of action wherein youth in the age group of 10 to 25 years from across the country are invited to join hands to address issues to climate change with an emphasis on sustainable lifestyles. In India, we have a long tradition of following a sustainable lifestyle. And in fact, uh, if you read teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, or rather, if you go back two generations back and look into what our grandparents were doing, it is so different from the way of the way we live today. It, we have moved from sustainability to consumeristic society over time. But it's also very nice to know that when you talk to even a young child who are in their primary school, they know what climate change means and how it's going to impact them and whether they can really continue with the consumeristic way of living. So they do question, they question themselves, they question us that are we following the right footsteps. But maybe this teaching is restricted because what I'm talking about, it is perhaps those who come from the families where there is, I should say, we are, we are harming planet more than many more. But when we look at what is impacting the planet, it is every citizen is adding to it. And therefore, it is important to take this message to all the schools, all the children. And therefore, uh, I personally feel what this particular initiative ha will have a lot of positive implications. We talk about school children 10 to 25 years so or school or college children at that age group. We have seen in the past that when it was say no to crackers, the impact was brought about by the children. These children are the future sleep, future leaders, and therefore it must be engraved in them what sustainability means. And the unfortunate part is that when we were born, when we came on this planet,
young climate change was talked about. And in our generation itself, we are facing that what we said may be the impact of climate change that has become a reality. So while we are worrying so much in terms of giving good education to our children, trying to save money for them and everything, we have, we are rather, I'll say, as irresponsible parents, we are also giving them a planet which needs repair, which needs a different way to be followed. So we are giving them a huge responsibility to respond and cope up with. So hence, the earlier we start preparing, involving youth to position against these odds, the better it is for them and for the entire humanity. With positive opportunities emerging from innovative developments, new technologies and startup and entrepreneurship ecosystems, forums like YCC offer an opening to bring together common concerns to promote sustainable solutions. We all are conscious of the fact that youth of today are more responsible and are demanding climate action from the world leaders. I'm not talking about activists. I'm talking about those who are really, really serious and in, they are also trying to practice whatever little they can do. You might have seen that there are now number of websites available where they say, mark your own carbon footprint during the day. And it's initiated by them. It's a good initiative. And it is thus imperative to address the concerns raised by them with knowledge-based solutions uh, so and solution-oriented responses. Avenues like YCC are important to bridging the gap. We are reaching out to a generation of children and teenagers to create a ripple effect to push the society towards environment responsible behavior and simultaneously explaining the science of climate change and global developments in this area. YCC, through its inception in 2019, has created several such opportunities of reaching out to Indian youth from all parts of the country. The, <coughs> the conclave promises to be an interesting event with high level speakers, video messages by senior dignitaries. <coughs> Sorry. Interviews, quiz, and youth debates. It will conclude with a youth pledge that will be presented in World Sustainable Development Summit, which is scheduled next week, 16th to 18th of February. And we are fully aware that climate change requires action at policy level and also changes in our personal lifestyle. In Terry, we have always mainstreamed voices of the youth in climate change discourse. It's crucial to understand that the future is in their hands and it is through them that we can usher in a new paradigm of change. On behalf of Terry, I welcome you all once again to the Youth Climate Conclave 2022 and also would like to see some of you during World Sustainable Development Summit next week. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful words. We are uh, thankful His Excellency, Mr. Vincenzo Di Luca, Ambassador of Italy for sparing his valuable time for YCC 2022. Sir, we request you to deliver your special address. Thank you, Dal. Thank you. I'm very delighted to open this uh, third edition of the Youth Climate Conclave along with the Director General Voteri, uh, our friend Dr. Viva Dawan my dear colleague Ambassador Ugo Astuto and Mr. Nilish Kumar Sahad, Joint Secretary at the Ministry of Environment. Today, we are virtually gathered here, again attesting to our consolidated discussion on the engagement of the young generation as key player in climate action. Just one year ago, we were starting our path towards the event held in Milan in September in the framework of BRICOP26 agenda, 
in view of the Glasgow COP26. Let me remind here that 2021 has witnessed Italy to be key player on the multilateral stage, particularly as G20 president, uh, where the main message people, planet and prosperity has been our beacon. We achieved remar remarkable results in the global agenda and also on the process towards Glasgow. We have been very focused on the relationship between people and planet, and we have always deemed the crucial creating a dialogue between institution and youth in the climate agenda. The involvement of a non-state actor such as youth in the negotiation process on climate change has undoubtedly been one of the relevant results of the days dedicated to the climate pre-COP26. In occasion of the Youth for Climate driving ambition, 400 young people selected from more than 8,700 8, applications all around the world, 189 countries belonging to UNFCCC accepted the challenge of passing, as the Italian Minister of Ecological Transformation, Cingolani, said in Milan, from protest to proposal. Two of them have been Indian young participants who, have the, who had the opportunity as well to join us in the National Youth Forum, an initiative organized, uh, as you remember, by, uh, by us with Terry. Until the Milan event, we were used to witnessing the expression of young people on the climate issues only through few, even if important, voices and well-known faces such as Greta Thunberg. The Youth for Climate event marked a significant step in overcoming division and giving a stronger shape to the young movement, especially through the complex process of discussion and drafting. Young participation had the chance to put forward ideas and concrete proposals, also tackling the difficult challenge in the climate agenda. Above all, they've been able to present a final document of their meeting and to pass the baton to the government delegation who kicked off the pre-COP on the same day. They especially underlined the importance of climate education, to which a panel led by our Minister of Education, Bianchi, was dedicated. They have sent and approved the key message on the four pillars of the negotiation. Youth driving ambition, sustainable recovery, non-state actor engagement, climate conscious society. Uh, they requested countries, international organizations, public and private financial institutions to urgently dedicate and make readily accessible funds to support youth participation in decision-making process with implication on climate change. They paid particular attention to energy transition. Let me now mention the strategic partnership that we adopt in the last uh, summit in Rome between Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister, Co uh, Prime Minister Draghi. Uh, in, the, in that summit, we adopt a joint statement on a strategic partnership on energy transition between Italy and India. This partnership focus on uh, sharing technology, expertise, research, investment here in India and in Italy, involving private sector, research center, universities, and this year we will launch a tech summit here in India on energy transition with uh, our friends of the, the uh, CII, with the, the uh, DST, with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Environment, I hope, and also the other relevant ministers and ministries. Uh, but uh, let me also, uh, a final sentence that I'm proud today to announce in this audience that the Italian Parliament yesterday approved a constitutional law for the inclusion of the protection of the environment in the Italian Constitution. Italy has definitely chose the path of sustainability. This is a good news, not only for Italy, but I think also for all the countries all over the world. Thank you.
Peru, over to you. Thank you, sir, for motivating our students. Uh, we look forward to working with your embassy like in the previous year, sir. Uh, moving on. No words would suffice to welcome His Excellency, Mr. Hugo Astuto, Ambassador of the European Union to India. Thank you for supporting the conclave in more ways than one, sir. Request you to please deliver the special remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, dear Director General, dear uh, Ambassador De Luca, Joint Secretary. I also recognize Ambassador Manjeev Singh uh, Puri on my screen. You know, and, uh, it's a it's, it's, it's great pleasure to be, to be here with you all uh, to, to open this um, youth climate conclave. Now, I, I think I'm stating the obvious by, by saying that the youth is, is the obvious stakeholder when, when we discuss about climate change and biodiversity loss, because it, it, it's about the very future of our planet. Um, 2022 is all up, also happens to be the European Year of Youth. And, and we, we, we will want to recognize uh, the importance of youth uh, in building uh, a better future, uh, greener, more resilient, inclusive, and more digital future. So I'm, I'm very happy that this year we could again partner with the, with the Ministry of Environment, with Terry, um, um, and other uh, partners in, in organizing this uh, youth climate conclave. Uh, reaching out to, 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 to young people from all over India. The, the, and uh, let, let me thank the organizer for, for putting together with yet again a very interesting program despite the challenges of, uh, of having to work um, uh, virtually. Um, I, I see a program that will, um, will bring together a number of um, uh, interesting speakers and, um, and discuss the latest scientific findings on climate change. Uh, as well as the state of play of negotiations after COP26. Now, on, on COP26, I, I think we all realize that by itself, obviously, it, it did not solve the, the climate uh, uh, crisis. Um, but still, um, uh, it, it did bring uh, the objectives of the Paris Agreement uh, somewhat closer. Uh, it, it kept these objectives within reach. Um, we, we, but it's, up, it's incumbent on now on us now to uh, to start implementing the deal. Um, COP26 embraced the um, highest level of ambition set in the Paris Agreement as our common target. So we, we now have a global uh, consensus on the need to limit um, uh, the increase in world temperature to 1.5 degrees uh, maximum. We had set ourselves three major objectives for, for COP26. So and ensure that um, ensure that we, we, we get global emission cuts uh, sufficient to keep global warming uh, well below two degrees, uh, aiming at 1.5. Uh, the, the second objective was to close the gap on the 100 billion climate finance scheme. And, and the third objective to complete the Paris rulebook, um, so that we can keep track of the progress um, and we can hold countries to to account for the action taken. And I think that on all of these three uh, issues, uh, these three objectives, Glasgow uh, delivered. I, I guess what, uh, you, you, you could argue that this is not enough, and you would uh, probably uh, be right. Uh, there, there is still a lot of work to do um, if we want to keep uh, global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius maximum. Uh, we, we need to implement the, the promises made uh, in Glasgow as, as rapidly as possible. Uh, including when it comes to the um, finance. Um, from the EU side, let, let me tell you a few a few words about what we do domestically within the European Union. I mean, our, our actions are, are guided by the European Green Deal. Uh, we, we want to change the, the very paradigm of our economic growth. We, we want to achieve growth through the protection of the environment and not at the expense uh, of the world we, we live in. Uh, we, 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 we want to transition towards a green, digital, and resilient economic model. And we want to move to um, a climate neutral continent by, by 2050 uh, to, a, to a clean, uh, circular economy. We, we understand it's a challenge, 
and um, and we understand that not everyone and every economic sector will, will immediately profit from from the transition so what we need to do is to ensure that um, in carbon intensive um, sectors uh, where workers are retrained and and that the poor uh, do not suffer from climate action uh, we, we want to leave no one behind but this said, the direction of travel is clear. Uh, we want a climate neutral euro by 2050. And we have enshrined this objective in law. So it's not just a political ambition. It's a legal prescription. Uh, and we have agreed to reduce um, emissions by at least 55% when compared to the 1990 baseline by 2030. Um, this is what the EU is trying to do domestically, but we are also realized that no country can tackle alone climate change or biodiversity loss. Uh, we, we, we need um, a global and cohesive effort. That, that's what the, 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 um, uh, the COP is all about. And, and India is a key stakeholder in this process. So the, the European Union is already working closely uh, with India in the area of energy efficiency of renewables, of sustainable finance, of, of climate mitigation and adaptation. Uh, it's a fact that both the European Union and India have very ambitious targets uh, when it comes to renewable energy for the next decade. And, and I think that we, we, we can, we, we shall demonstrate that um, strong government goals can drive innovation. Uh, innovation in our economies in order to contribute to reaching the, the, the goals set in the Paris Agreement. Uh, let, let me conclude here so simply by recalling again that more than anyone else, the, the, the youth uh, will be affected uh, by uh, climate change. So it's important that you speak up, that the youth speaks up, and, um, and that you act as a constant spur uh, to action. We, we have to be ambitious, and we need to take action now uh, for the sake of the future of our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you for your remarks, sir, and uh, sharing an overview on, cl on climate actions that the delegation is spearheading. It is an honor for all of us to have Mr. Nilesh Kumar Sa, Joint Secretary, Climate Change, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India, for gracing the occasion. We request you to deliver the keynote address. Thank you, Taro. Dr. Viva Dhawan, DG Perry, His Excellency Mr. Vincenzo de Luca, Ambassador of Italy to India, His Excellency Mr. Hugo Astuto, Ambassador of the European Union to India, invitees from various organizations, my dear young friends. First of all, I would like to compliment the organizers for organizing this youth conclave and such times online and ensuring a very good participation. I am extremely delighted to address this conclave today, which is an important part of the EU-India project partnership for implementation of the Paris Agreement. The delegation of the European Union to India, along with GIZ India, Terry, CEEW, has hosted two successful youth conclaves, climate conclaves, in the past. And I'm glad to be part of the third edition of this conclave. Friends, Climate change is a global, global concern today and is likely to pose long-term impacts on the planet. Global concerted efforts are the need of the hour to deal with the issue. And I would not be wrong in saying that youth has an important role to play in dealing with the issue of climate change as they are the drivers of the social transformation and have the power to transform our societies towards a low carbon and climate resilient future. India, with a population of 1.3 billion, is one of the most populous countries in the world and houses one of the youngest populations globally. This provides us with abundance of potential and opportunities for engagement of youth in India's journey on low carbon development pathway. For this, it is very important that our youth is informed, aware, and educated about the issue of climate change and its impacts the efforts that can play important role in dealing with this issue, 
and how it all can be initiated through behavioral change and following a sustainable lifestyle at individual level. To add to this, let me highlight the fact that although India is home to a population of 1.3 billion, its per capita emissions are about one third of the global average. India's share of world population is 17 percent, but the share in cumulative historical emissions is just 4 percent. The issue of climate change has been a result of unconscious exploitation of resources and unsustainable consumption and production. Although India's contribution to the issue is minimal, the issue of global warming and climate change have no boundaries, and therefore India is committed to taking global steps to deal with the issue of climate change. Globally, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change is the primary international body for global climate change negotiations. The Paris Agreement has been a milestone in global climate cooperation and aims to enhance the implementation of the convention through elements of mitigation, adaptation, finance, technology, transfer, capacity building, and transparency of action and support, and recognizes the principles of equity and common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, one of the most important principles in light of different national circumstances. It also recognizes the importance of climate justice and sustainable lifestyles. In recognition of the growing problem of climate change, and despite being a developing country, India declared a voluntary goal of reducing the emissions intensity of its GDP by 20 to 25 percent over 2005 levels by 2020. India has achieved a reduction in emissions intensity of its GDP by 24 percent between 2005 and 2016, thereby almost achieving its voluntary goal. Under the Paris Agreement, India also submitted its NDCs, which were basically related to reduction in emission intensity of GDP by 30 to 35 percent by 2030 from the 2005 level to achieve about 40 percent cumulative electric installed capacity from non-fossil fuel based energy resources by 2030 and to create an additional carbon sink of 2.5 billion to 3 billion tons of CO2 equivalent through additional forest and tree cover by 2030. The five other targets pertain to sustainable lifestyles, climate friendly cleaner path, climate change adaptation, climate finance, and technology and capacity building. Recently, at the COP26, our Honorable Prime Minister of India announced five vector elements, Panchamrit, towards India's climate action. They include India will reach its non fossil energy capacity to 5,000 gigawatt by 2030. India will meet 50% of its energy requirements from renewable energy by 2030. India will reduce the total projected carbon emissions by 1 billion tons from now onwards till 2030. By 2030, India will reduce the carbon intensity of its economy by less than 45%. And by the year 2070, India will achieve the target of net zero. Also, calling for mindful and deliberate utilization as opposed to mindless and destructive consumption. At the same summit, Honorable Prime Minister also launched a campaign, Life, Lifestyle for Environment, for Environment Conscious Lifestyle, focusing on mindful and deliberate utilization of resources. At the same time, he also stressed on the need for climate finance and technology transfer from the developed countries and mentioned that there was a need to monitor climate finance as it is done for monitoring of climate mitigation actions. Recognizing the urgency of taking strong climate action to keep the goals of Paris Agreement on track, Government of India has initiated numerous schemes and programs to deal with the issue of climate change. Our conscious and informed efforts by individuals are equally important. It is essential to strengthen both formal and informal education on climate change and viable lifestyles. In addition, sustainable production and consumption patterns must be promoted and youth supported as environmental champions in their local communities. The government recognizes the need and importance of education, training, and awareness in facilitating and enhancing participation of people in climate action. 
India's communication and outreach programs are broadly focused on harmonizing traditional and modern climate friendly values and practices. The Government of India launched the India Climate Change Knowledge Portal in November 2020 as a single point information resource which captures sector wise adaptation and mitigation actions that are being taken by various line ministries in one place, including updated information on their implementation. The portal helps in disseminating knowledge among citizens about all major steps the government is taking at both national and international levels to address climate change issues. Under this PIPA project, climate change learning labs for awareness creation and capacity building are being set up at the state level. These labs can be visited by relevant stakeholders, including students, government officials, people's representatives, vulnerable communities, NGOs, and media, enabling on demand delivery, delivery of knowledge. The labs will provide information on climate change in an interesting, interactive, and experimental manner, which will enhance the learning process and the involvement of different stakeholders in the climate action. India's national mission on strategic knowledge on climate change as part of our national action plan on climate change has a focus on creating awareness and understanding regarding climate change issues, particularly amongst students and youth. Another important program, National Green Corps, covers around 120,000 schools in India with NGC school eco clubs. This major initiative for creating environmental awareness among children aims at building cadres of young children working towards environmental conservation and sustainable development. The program seeks to redirect the consciousness of students towards environmental friendly attitudes and actions and goes beyond schools promoting school society interactions to sensitize society. The Government of India also launched the School Nursery Yojana, an initiative to bring students closer to nature by involving them in raising of saplings in nurseries created in schools. The underlying theme of the Yojana or the plan is to plant a tree for sustainable future and to make the nation clean and green. India Long-Term Ecology Observatories is a climate change action program launched by the government, which is a multi-institutional, multidisciplinary, all India coordinated project led by Indian Institute of Science, Bengaluru. It aims to understand the biophysical and anthropogenic drivers of ecosystem change and their effects on socio-ecological responses. The ministry also launched Green Good Deeds movement in January 2018 as a social movement to bring about mass environmental awareness among society. The movement aims to encourage every citizen in the country to adopt Green Good Deeds in his or her daily life. The green good deeds are also promoted in schools and colleges through the National Green Corps Eco Club program. The United Nations also recognizes the important role that youth play in tackling climate change and works closely with youth led and youth focused organizations around the world through the United Nations Joint Framework Initiative on Children, Youth, and Climate Change. Since 2008, the Joint Framework Initiative has been coordinating efforts by 16 intergovernmental entities and many youth organizations to empower youth to take adaptation and mitigation actions and enhance effective participation of youth in climate change policy decision making process. On these lines, I would like to stress that it is crucial that joint environmental initiatives aimed at building the capacity of youth as future leaders and driving forces of climate regime are undertaken. Considerable efforts are also needed in strengthening the active capability and resilience of youth in rural communities in developing countries. I'm sure our youth is ready to take advantage of the new environment-oriented development opportunities as well. Growing attention to climate change and sustainable development of offers a chance for sustainable economic growth in the country. The youth of today must take efforts to educate themselves as well as the society about the issue of climate change and how the smallest of efforts can contribute directly to the fight against climate change by adopting sustainable lifestyles. I hope that this edition of the Youth Climate Conclave enables collective efforts and brings fruitful outcomes towards shaping the country's future through the leaders of tomorrow, that is, the youth 
so creating awareness on the issues and impacts of climate change. Thank you very much. We extend a wholehearted gratitude to you, sir, for your presence and for sharing the role of youth as so crucial to the ministry. And we are also thankful to the ministry for spearheading SPIPA project and guiding us in organizing the conclave. So thank you very much. I now request Dr. Livleen uh, Kaur Kehalon, Associate Director and Senior Fellow, Environment, Education and Awareness, Terry, to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Taru. A very good afternoon to everyone. His Excellency, Mr. Vincenzo Di Luca, Ambassador of Italy to India. His Excellency, Mr. Hugo Escuto, Ambassador of the European Union to India. Honorable Joint Secretary, Mr. Nilesh Kumar Saha, Ministry of Environment, Forests and Climate Change, Government of India. Dr. Vibhadhavan, Director General Terry. Thank you for your gracious presence in today's program. An event of this magnitude, as you see in the agenda, can be lined up with a common shared vision of stakeholders who have independently but collectively endeavored to contribute towards success. Thank you so much for sparing your time to be a part of this prestigious event. And it is actually a hat trick of three continuous years to happen. So thank you so much for your presence. We take with us a few important messages, uh, as mentioned by His Excellency Ambassador of Italy, from protest to proposal. Thank you, sir, for the slogan. We will take it forward and we will see to it that there are proposals, there are action projects cultivated across the country from awareness to action. His Excellency Ambassador of the European Union to India, Mr. Hugo Estuto. So you are with us right from the inception from 2019. And it is your encouragement and positive presence that has made this uh, year an annual event a big success. Thank you so much for your blessings. MOEFCC uh, uh, has been a continuous supporter of this endeavor both for, uh, in uh, terms of uh, uh, content and also presence. So we would like to acknowledge the involvement of eco clubs and state model agencies spread across the country who have through the environment education and climate change divisions at MOEFCC come forward to be a part of this initiative. It has been through their support that we have been able to reach out to across the schools across the country in spite of the shutdown of institutes due to lockdown. Thank you so much, uh, uh, sir, for your presence today and also for the support of the ministry we have got for the initiative. I also take the opportunity to thank Dr. Vibha Dhawan because it is her role, her position that has ensured that Terry's research and outreach reaches out to all the communities across the country. YCC is a program of success. It is a program of reflection. It is a program of action. And with all the beautiful emojis that we have been seeing for the last 45 minutes, it shows that students are interested in these initiatives. So with this uh, uh, note, I would say that we will continue to endeavor to move forward with more positive action. And we also wish to extend a sincere thank you to the content support received from World Bank, Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation, CEEW, CII, C-STEP, Dalmia Siemens Limited, MS Swaminathan Research Foundation, Climate, uh, Climate Group India, and many others who have uh, taken out time to be a part of this program. So uh, we move forward and we conclude the inaugural uh, uh, session now with a sincere thank you to all present. Thank you so much. Thank you, Libri. Uh, for your uh, thank, uh, for your vote of thanks, I would now request all the dignitaries to please switch on your uh, camera so that we can take a print screen. So please. Uh, I also request the panelists of the next session to switch on the cameras, please. Uh, Dr. Dhavan, is Dr. Dhavan there? Uh, 
thank you to all the dignitaries for joining us in the inaugural session. Uh, moving on, we now begin with the panel discussions. Thank you, sir. Session one focuses on the notion of understanding the science of climate change and global communities response over achieving net zero targets. The session is moderated by Dr. Vaibhav Chaturvedi, fellow Council on Energy, Environment and Water. The speakers of the session are Ambassador Manjeev Puri, distinguished fellow Terry, we welcome you, sir. Uh, Mr. Koyal Kumar Mandan, Chief of Program Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation. Thank you, sir, for joining in and we welcome you. Professor T. Jayaraman, Senior Fellow, MS Swaminathan Research uh, Foundation. We welcome you too, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chaturvedi, for joining in today. Uh, from here on, I hand over to you for further proceedings. Great. Thank you so much, Taru. A very good afternoon to all the colleagues here on the call. And I do see there are many young colleagues from schools and colleges who have joined this uh, this discussion. So very happy to be you know, engaging with all of you. So this session is, is about uh, uh, a very important term that has been you know, being discussed uh, and debated now world over. It's called net zero, uh, and uh, I will I will talk a bit about net zero in my introductory remarks, and especially because I do see that as I said, many colleagues from schools and colleges are here. So this term might be something new for you. Uh, so I will just explain a bit, uh, and then we'll move on to the panel discussion. We've got an excellent panel today. I'm very happy to be moderating the discussion today. So what is really uh, you know net zero? So uh, to just explain uh, in in simple terms. Net zero is essentially about greenhouse gas emissions. So this this is a youth climate conclave, uh, and uh, we know that climate change is happening. It's happening much faster than we we always thought. So uh, big shifts are happening, and in India we are already seeing uh, these the impact of these big shifts. Uh, so net zero essentially what uh, our honourable Prime Minister Modi announced in Glasgow uh, a few months back is simply uh, you know taking our green greenhouse gas emissions which are on a rising trajectory to zero. You know, that is what net zero is essentially about. And for net zero, one has to understand the plus and the minus. The plus simply means that all the emissions that are, you know, increasing. For example, if you own a car, if you use a car or a two wheeler, it leads to carbon dioxide emissions. If you use electricity in your house, the electricity is produced by coal, generally speaking in India, uh, and which leads to emissions. So all of these factors contribute to the plus. And then there is the minus. Minus essentially uh, is, you know, many times it is the trees. We know that when trees are grown, it, it, they capture uh, carbon dioxide. So this is essentially the one example of minus. Essentially, net zero is all about mitigating climate change. That is extremely important for our country. And that is why I'm very happy that so many youth uh, colleagues have joined uh, from schools and colleges uh, in today's discussion. Uh, the announcement which the prime minister made, in my view, it's, it's a, it's a path breaking announcement. Because, you know, as, as you would know, India is a fast growing economy. So uh, our incomes as of now are much lower as compared to the developed world. And as India is growing fast, our incomes are also growing. And as a result of the growth in incomes, now you would see more and more people are buying, you know, two wheelers. From two wheelers, people, you know, buy four wheelers. And then many, many people are buying air conditioners. So essentially, when income grows, it leads to a lot of consumption in the economy, which leads to emissions. So uh, even for a fast growing economy, the prime minister has made this commitment that 50 years from now, uh, that India will will be achieving a net zero is a very uh, is a path breaking kind of announcement. It's a very important policy signal, and it gives a sense of certainty. Essentially, I have been talking to you know many private sector players, many industry leaders over the past couple of months after the announcement has been made. And for all the industry players, uh, this is an extremely important announcement because industrial investments have a very long gestation period, so they are made for anywhere 30 to 40 years kind of you know thinking ahead. So these are very strategic and very important investments. These are big investments uh, that are that that are made to happen. Uh, so this announcement of net zero uh, it gives a very clear signal to all these investors that 50 years down the line, you know, the country has to achieve net zero. Uh, essentially, it has to ensure that there are no emissions. You know, so that this is a very important signal uh, that has come from the government uh, and which ensures that all the investors align around this uh, kind of announcement. And along with the private sector and the industry players, what is very important is also the role of government policy. So as many of my young colleagues here uh, would have listened to the budget, which was just presented uh, more than a week back on the first of this month, 
the finance minister in the beginning itself said that energy and climate change are very important pillars of of, of, the, of budget this year you know uh, so you see the, the country is responding the government policy is also responding uh, to this challenge of climate change and the, the the target of net zero that the prime minister has announced and along with the private sector and along with the society and you know, all of us have a very important role to play uh, in our homes in our uh, daily activities to ensure that emissions are mitigated uh, and together we kind of hope to achieve net zero uh, as as the kind of direction that has been sent set by the uh, leadership of the country so these are just uh, some you know quick remarks uh, for sharing what net zero is about uh, to uh, to my all the colleagues uh, here uh, with this let me uh, you know welcome all the esteemed panelists to the discussion today all the panelists are uh, they need no introduction or ambassador manjeet puri is a distinguished fellow at terry and has a long and illustrious years of service uh, for the government of india uh, mr koil kumar mandal is a chief of program uh, of shakti sustainable energy foundation uh, which uh, supports a lot of uh, you know uh, energy and climate green energy and climate uh, change mitigation uh, activities and research in india and professor t jairaman who is a senior fellow at the ms swaminathan research foundation uh, he is an extremely famous and uh, you know intellectual and a person who has guided so much of thought uh, of you know young and emerging leaders and researchers in india so i do welcome all the panelists today very happy to be uh, you know having discuss this discussion so let me first welcome ambassador puri uh, you for your you know thoughts on this issue of the net zero the importance of it the science behind it how does the global community uh, should respond within india there are so many you know your youth who have joined us on the call today from colleges and schools how do uh you know, how, what do how do they make sense of this particular debate and what do they need, they need to do to participate in it and that's the puri please the floor is yours thank you well, well thank you very much and i'm delighted to see you here uh let me say this is my second participation in this youth climate conflict and i want to thank my colleague livlin dalo from peri who's been spearheading it and i don't see our great friend from the european union anywhere on the screen but you know edwin has been the yes, gentleman who has been really pushing it and edwin thank you to you it was good to see your ambassador there grateful to him to the italian embassy and to all the others and of course i'm very happy to see that the joint secretary himself from the ministry of environment and climate change was present and he had so many nice things to say I have, in fact, told uh, Libli to try and have some of those things transcribed and circulated among all the young people who are there, because it's one thing for you to hear us; it's another thing for you to have this readily available in terms of what Webber calls direction setting. So, young friends, let me say welcome, and I am so delighted that what some three hundred odd of you have signed on just now, and it's. purely a measure of the kind of interest which rests in the subject of climate change today among people in india in general and i am very glad in fact not surprised that the young people are more wedded to it because you know it's going to be your life and you have every right to ask what these guys with white hair and white beards are doing at this particular place i'll come to that also in a minute it has something to do with the science of climate change so you know uh many of you are involved with it but let's say there are two basic aspects one is the entire aspect of you know who done it and who done it i think is very clear uh one is the fuel that we have used and for the past 150 odd years we have relied ourselves on carbon fuels they've made our life wonderful believe me three four generations back life wasn't as comfortable as that we can keep saying it was happier or not i don't know but it certainly wasn't as comfortable longevity wasn't there we are consuming more so much more is happening but it comes at a price and the price is something that we are paying in terms of our planet we would perhaps call this global warming which was the initial word with which this entire business started because the problem with carbon emissions which results carbon dioxide carbon usage which results in carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere is that it remains in the atmosphere for a very long time so today what you are doing hmm do something about it but you know it's what your grandparents did which is still wasting on you and that is why i hope you agree that some of us with white beards are allowed out here because all that you will do 
will be very important, critical, and of course, nothing can be done in terms of what all of us have already done. But I think it's very important to understand that in terms of the way the world plays out things, there is an understanding that people like me, my generation, and before that, three generations before me, also owe a debt of responsibility to you. And those who contributed most, you know, they need to pay their little bit to it. Polluter pays is what we uh, what we usually say, but polluter pays in this case started a long time back. And that too needs to be, you know, accounted for. Very important and something that we must always remember. Having said this, let me leave two thoughts with all of you. My first thought is, this is all areas, and we have Professor Jairaman, who is one of India's leading experts, may perhaps wish to spend a few minutes trying to explain to you exactly what the science of equity is in this entire business. But, you know, I want to speak in terms of exhortation. I want you involved in climate action. And what are the two or three thoughts that I'd leave with you? One is something which the Joint Secretary mentioned and which Web have also mentioned, which is sustainability. So each of us, as we live through our life, the longer we live, the more we will consume. The better our lives, usually the more we will consume. Since much of these things start and end with some degree of carbon emissions, we add a greater amount to the atmosphere. Now, if we can be more sustainable in what we do, and I leave small, simple thoughts with everyone because, you know, at the end of the day, to do global action, a lot will have to be acted locally. So if I quote the Prime Minister in something that he used in a different context, local action for global act activity and for global reaction is absolutely important. And that's why I leave with you the thought, try and look at sustainability for yourself in your environment, in the school and college where you are, in the locality where you live. Today, India's great and big push is renewable energy. So if we try and encourage ourselves, our families, our friends and relatives to try and switch more and more to electric power rather than other kinds of power, and if much of that electric power is sourced from renewable sources, then let me tell you, even in the process of not having been able to get rid of all your emissions, no, that's not, that's why we're using the expression net. For those of you who have studied a little bit of mathematics, you will know that the expression being used is net zero and not gross zero. Gross zero is pretty nearly impossible in terms of the kinds of technology that we have today. But what we are talking about is that you will only emit that much of greenhouse gases as you are in a position to absorb through trees, through forest cover, maybe in time through carbon sequestration and for carbon storage, etc. I don't know what may happen and how technology will develop, but that's what we are trying to see. Essentially, there is this concept called mitigation, which means try and produce as little of greenhouse gas. Now, we all know that nobody's life should be disrupted, life should go on well, the standards of living should rise, you should have a better and fuller life. But in doing this, can you try and move yourself a little bit? And let me tell you, while it appears to all of us that my little action will have no impact on the rest of the world, and that may be a truism in mathematical terms, and certainly important when countries negotiate their share of the global carbon budget, but in terms of action, please do it. Because every little action by every human being on earth adds to what we are doing in terms of our contribution to what is certainly perhaps the most important global problem. The second thing I want to talk to you about, because you know this net zero doesn't talk about it at all. And why doesn't it talk about it? Because those who have propounded, and I'm all for propounding net zero, their ideas on all of this are basically, we've done what we've done. Sorry, we got grandfathered. Today I can raise my hand and say, I'm sorry, I did it. But come on, guys, now you pitch up to it. Fair enough. But we in the developing world, and in a country like India more than anyone, anywhere else, we are also afflicted very, very hugely by the impact of climate change. So what are the impacts of climate change? 
the most talked about things are rise in sea levels. You and I may really think that that was not going to happen in my lifetime, will not happen tomorrow, fair enough. But do remember what you have seen places like Mumbai, seeing floods, seeing increased action in terms of typhoons, in terms of tsunami, not, not tsunami, those are uh, earthquake caused, but increased action in terms of sea volatility, uh, floods, droughts, etc. Each of these things are things that get caused. And consequently, what we need to do in a country like India, in equal measure, while we focus ourselves hugely on trying to reduce our and more than that, the carbon intensive energy footprint, we need to at the same time work very strenuously that all around us, we adapt ourselves to what has already happened and will happen, i.e. certain degree of impacts of climate change are inevitable. They are inevitable. Why? Because they got grandfathered and they are there from the times of our ancestors. We've done it. It's there in the atmosphere. It will play out. What do we do to prepare ourselves for that? If there is a flood, are we ready to meet it? Are we doing things not just in terms of reducing the production of greenhouse gases, but in terms of adjusting to it? And in a country like India, South Asia, in fact, the entire amount of South Asia, where vulnerabilities are great, this becomes an equally important element of what we need to focus on. So I want to stop now. I think I've taken up my 10 minutes share. I'd be happy to answer questions. I want to tell you very strongly, act sustainably. Move your lifestyles to be more sustainable. Be mindful that even your little actions contribute to global action. Be, try and see that all around you, there is a degree of if I may use a simple word, preparedness, and adaptation, as we call it, to what is happening. But do remember that you act local, you contribute globally. Thank you very much and wish you all all the best. Great. Thank you so much, Ambassador Puri. I think on the chat itself, uh, many of our school friends are writing that it's a great speech. Uh, I think we have learned a lot, and especially the point that you have made at the end, uh, which is about that act sustainably. And in the middle also, you said the charity begins at home. So even little actions and that you could that our colleagues here, young friends can uh, you know adopt at home in schools they can go a long way in addressing you know this global challenge of climate change so thank you again ambassador you. Puri, for your insightful remarks thank we you. Love it. and let us go to uh, mr koel kumar mandal who, who is with the shakti sustainable energy foundation uh koel the floor is yours uh we look forward to your speech thank you Bhavab. um First of all, uh, let me thank the organizers, the European Union, GIZ, Terry, for inviting me and Shakti Foundation to this panel. It's really exciting to be here. Um, I don't think I've addressed to um, so many young people, college-going students, school-going students uh, before this. So definitely an honor and a privilege to do that. Um, I think uh, Ambassador Puri, um, and after me, Professor Jairaman are very well qualified to talk about the science, the equity aspect of climate change and uh, our action towards that. So what I will do is mainly focus on sort of the, the low carbon transition pathway, the net zero commitment that you started with, uh, commitments that uh, countries across the world, including India, have made, and what that means for the youth of our country, and of course, across the world. Um, and I think you you made the point that it's a it's a path breaking announcement. I think it's a historic moment for all of us. And although we have made the commitment, I don't think many of us realize what it really means for the economy for the society. I don't think we have fully internalized that. Um, and why do I say that? Um, because I think the structure of the economy as we know it is going to change. It's going to result in massive shifts. Um, many of us grew up, you know, riding petrol diesel vehicles. In 10, 15 years, there will be no petrol or diesel vehicles. There'll be probably electric vehicles. The petrol stations, the gas stations that we know will probably become energy service stations and not just petrol diesel stations, right? They'll be uh, charging your electric vehicles. They'll be providing you hydrogen. They'll be giving you a whole lot of other services. 
the food we eat, um, that might be different tomorrow. We are already looking at things like Beyond Burger, looking at plant-based burgers, looking at regenerative agriculture, um, natural food sources. So what we eat, uh, the mobility choices we make, everything is going to be different. Um, and of course, there is the element of uh, what Ambassador Puri talked about in the end, the impact of climate change. Um, and especially for a climate vulnerable country like India, we already see and live the impacts. It's not something that's going to come in the future 10 years from now. And not just India, I think the past few years have shown us that the global north is no exception to this. Earlier, we thought that somehow this was a developing country problem. The impact of climate change, floods, wildfire, extreme weather events, um, it's happening across the globe. And therefore, um, you know, as youth become responsible members of the society tomorrow, there are choices to be made there as well. What kind of houses do you live in? Um, what kind of, uh, again, the, the food habits, the lifestyle choices that speakers before me mentioned. But let me go back again and emphasize the point on the economy, because that's where I feel, you know, a lot of concern for the youth, especially uh, in terms of sort of what kind of jobs, what kind of companies do they work for and all of that, right? So, um, like I mentioned, there will be a lot of new sectors, a lot of new areas of work that will uh, result as a, uh, that will emerge as a result of the commitments that we have made. Um, for example, uh, like the examples I gave in, in renewable energy sector, uh, Mr. Puri spoke before me, in the electric vehicle segment, in industry, the entire supply chain is going to look different. In the finance sector, um, Reserve Bank of India recently signed on to the network for greening of financial system. You know, the choices we make in terms of investments, you know, what kind of assets do we own? Are those assets carbon intensive assets or more green assets? Um, and I think this is where uh, the interaction of youth will change totally. A, because of the choices you make as a responsible citizen, that will of course matter a lot in the kind of future we have. But B, also your interaction with economic activity. Um, and we did some modeling studies as part of understanding what a net zero transition means. And what it told us is, you know, there are several studies, and of course there are a range, but in each of these studies, we have seen that there will be at least um, 20 to 30 million additional jobs uh, by 2050, for example. And this is additional to what would otherwise happen in a regular course of business activity. And these jobs are going to be in new sectors, green sectors, that will require a whole different skill set, um, more technology oriented, a uh, lot of information technology uh, enabled services. So I think the youth needs to prepare themselves for that, uh, to be able to uh, sort of make themselves competitive in that environment um, and sort of prepare others in the process because it's not just sort of individual choices, but also community choices and as a group, where do we go? So I think that's that's very important. And the last thought that I'll leave everyone with, and something that you know um, I personally grapple with a lot, we had a discussion in the morning as well on this. Um, how do we um, change, um, or how do you build awareness among the youth of the nation? Um, and how does that lead to behavior change? Because ultimately what we are looking at is behavior change. Right? Of course, there are policies at the national level, state level, but ultimately, uh, people like you and I, we have to buy these electric vehicles. We have to ask for these uh, power generation from renewable sources, et cetera, right? More natural, organic food, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, of course, there's a, there's a great participation in this event, and that's very encouraging. But how do we think about the, uh, the youth of the country as a whole, right? Um, uh, people in rural areas riding a bike, carrying a... 6,000 rupees smartphone in their hands. Um, people in places like, you know, Udupi selling dosa in Italy. You know, how do we get to those, that that kind of people? Because I think it's not just a debate that's centered around Delhi and Bombay anymore. It, it has to be a mass sort of uh, awareness now. And I don't have an answer to the question. Um, there are also a lot of uh, interactive web-based tools, social media, uh, it's got both positives and negatives, but I think that's where the other role for youth is. 
how do you as you know engaged uh, citizens then work with community with other uh, young people and generate that awareness and finally convert that into uh, behavioral uh, choices so i'll i'll end with that and uh, happy to speak more uh, later over to you guys Great. Great. thank you so much koyal and uh, looking at the chat i know that you know the friends from schools are listening to you very closely and you made some very important point first of all how do we reach uh, to all the you know young generation beyond the big cities like delhi and uh, you know mumbai or all the other metro cities how do we reach you know the rural areas the the smaller towns uh, with this climate change related perspective is very important and we should take advantage of social media i do hope that all the school uh, you know friends that are listening to this call they will also try to you know find answers to these questions because we might not have answers to all of these and you also talked about some very interesting and important things that the that the way of uh, behavior today like so many people use petrol cars today petrol vehicles today maybe 15 years down the line all we would be using be electric cars and i saw in the chat box also somebody said that you know her father encourages everybody to use electric cars so that's very encouraging and that's the kind of behavior we want you know all of us uh, to adopt so thank you again koyal uh, for your speech it was wonderful listening to you uh, let me also ask if there is if all the school friends are listening if there are any question you want to ask please post it in the chat chat box we have very limited time but i would definitely like to ask one question from the panelists today if there are anything on your mind please feel free to post thank you so much uh, with this i would uh, let me go to uh, you know uh, professor jairaman professor jairaman uh, we look forward to hearing you uh, and the floor is yeah. yours uh, you've got yeah. 10 minutes for the speech thank you so much professor jairaman yeah uh, uh, thank you uh, dr vaibhav chaturvedi uh for your very nice introduction and uh, uh, uh also uh, my uh, let me begin by greeting all the dignitaries who are on uh, present on this uh, occasion and of course i thank uh, the organizers for this opportunity to speak to you so let me proceed uh, in a very uh, straightforward way to uh, answer, uh, uh, you know, the organizers have provided a very useful list of questions. So perhaps I will use that to uh, structure what I am going to say. So first thing we must remember, and this is something that has become very clear, uh, only in the last uh, four to five years in climate science, that if you want to limit temperatures, meaning the global increase in temperature to any particular limit, then your total emissions, called cumulative emissions, meaning uh, from the time that the Industrial Revolution started, that is 1850, until the time, you know, uh, when it will reach a zero, you have to limit your cumulative emissions to what is called the global carbon budget. It's like saying, you know, if you want to spend, you have only so much money, you would call it a budget. Similarly, if you want to limit the temperature increase, then there is a global carbon budget. Now, this budget is known so far uh, uh, reaching the temperature target of 1.5 degrees increase in temperature from the uh, in the pre industrial period. The uh, global carbon budget is about 3000 billion tons of carbon dioxide. There are other gases, but that's a matter of detail. We'll talk about that a little later. So this of this 3,000 tons, which is available to the entire world, something like 83% of it is already over. It's already been used up. Used up meaning what? Corresponding amount of cumulative emissions has already taken place. So what is left over is only about uh, 500 uh, uh, gigatons or billion tons of carbon dioxide is all that the entire world can emit. 
Now, we are all very clear that if we live in a shared world, a shared planet, that uh, is the home for all of humanity, then its resources should also be shared. Why do we call global carbon budget a resource? Because carbon dioxide emissions are not strictly speaking like pollution. It's not like smoke, which is bad for you. Carbon dioxide is the product of the use of fossil fuels. And throughout the last 150 years or 200 years, fossil fuels have been very important for the development of all the industrial revolution that we see around us and that is so essential to a modern life. But now, of course, we have to get off that. That is very clear. But then the rate at which different countries develop is not the same for reasons partly maybe their own doing, but for a lot of the world, it is because of the period of colonial rule, when your decisions are not in your hands, your land is ruled by other people. So for India, we have control over our economy and our uh, future, only roughly speaking from 1947. But so if you take the, and many other countries in the world got independence after us. So you see development across the world takes place at different rates. But unfortunately what has happened is that the global resource, which is a common resource, has been used up by other people, uh, other countries earlier. So now this has to be shared equitably. So those who have used up this global resource need to reduce their emissions much more rapidly than the rest of the uh, other countries and give them a chance to be able to have some emissions because even today, as Ambassador Puri reminded you, we cannot 100% uh, quit uh, fossil fuels. And countries like India, have a huge development deficit that we have to overcome. So, for instance, uh, you know, I was amused by uh, this, uh, uh, my friend who uh, said her, uh, the, the father encourages the use of electric vehicles. That's a very good thing. And if you can afford it, uh, you know, that's very good. But I must say, frankly, that I will not be able to afford an electric vehicle at the prices they sell today. So, but that, you know, I can manage otherwise. So that's not a big problem. The real issue is 70% or 65 to 66% of our people, of our country. And when I talk to youth, I remind them, your brothers and sisters in both urban and rural India live in conditions that are, must be described as that of poverty. So overcoming poverty, poverty eradication, and ensuring a prosperous well-being is our first duty. And climate change makes that duty not less important, but even more important and even more uh, urgent. And the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, recognizes this. That's why it says when you take, uh, uh, when you undertake climate action, it must be on the basis of equity and common but differentiated responsibility. Everybody has to do something, but the rate at which and the extent of which every country does will, depend, will vary depending on their uh, levels of development. So from the government of India, we have always made clear in different ways and now more recently, very explicitly, that India believes that every country should get a fair share of the global carbon budget. And this, of course, they must use responsibly. So every innovation to reduce emission helps us. 
because then with as little with whatever carbon budget we have we can do more that is very clear but at the same time <coughs> we as a country and our people are entitled to a fair share of the global carbon budget the problem with climate action across the world today and why the situation is one of such urgency is unfortunately we live in an unequal world and in this unequal world those who have the responsibility for doing more have not done their share this is unfortunately a bitter truth which is why india's climate policy especially from the period of the paris agreement two things india has emphasized in the speeches of the prime minister as well as otherwise one is the concept of climate justice and that's very important second is that some part of the world a few cannot consume all the resources and uh, therefore they must we must all have sustainable lifestyles in india the problem is not one of sustainable lifestyle india for instance consumes about 0.4 kilograms of on an average of meat per capita per year okay 4 kilogram sorry and whereas the world average is 40 and the highest consumers one of which happens to be the united states consume over 100 kilograms of meat per capita per year so definitely they should move to a meat based diet but i don't think in india that is a immediate necessity so what should we focus on we should focus on development our development should be low carbon we will not have unlimited carbon space or uh, share of the global carbon budget like the rich countries we must do our share and be responsible but development must remain our priority low carbon development let me remind you of the following and so everybody talks of net zero what did what has india announced then net zero 2070 so 2070 from today is 50 years away imagine where our country was in 1950 there were no iits there were no uh, institutions we were dreaming of uh, atomic power we were dreaming of a space program there was no green revolution nothing was there and the life expectancy in the 30s was 29 or 30 years and by 50s it had just started going up what happened after 15 years you think of 2000 which is in the lifetime or uh, uh, very close to your lifetime many of the young people today the world has completely changed for india we have still many a long way to go we still have many duties before us there are still a large number of our brothers and sisters who have to uh, you know reach levels of uh, uh, well being that we can consider tolerable but at the same time think of all that happens in 50 years yes, so sorry as a gentleman uh, yeah, 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 uh, just winding up already yeah. over time thank you yeah so in this uh, situation how should we look to the future so one thing is eventually we we'll have to reach a net zero all that is true but remember that this is not simply a question of modeling this is not simply a question of mathematically calculating what are all the things we can or cannot do it also has to do with inspiration with innovation a passion for giving our brothers and sisters better lives more efficient lives this is what will take us to net zero as a safe secure and prosperous nation so this i think should be the way we understand net zero 
Next zero by itself is not uh, sufficient. It is like saying, you know, if you take only a limited amount of water, at some point you must close the tap. Of course, that is true. So what you must remember is our share of the global carbon budget between now and net zero, which is 50 years away, we must use it efficiently in a scientifically advanced way, exerting all of our efforts at innovation. So we make so that we can make the best use of this for our future. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Jairaman, for this for highlighting many, many important aspects uh, of the larger debate. I also requested all the uh, friends from schools to uh, pose their questions, and there are many, many very interesting, you know, questions that have come. We have we don't have so much time, but there are questions related to you know, uh, like would artificial intelligence robots take over the jobs, even though there is a lot of potential for jobs. Uh, you know, is there a way for teaching people about virtual? Uh, you know, water usage uh, is there. Should the developed nations assist developing ones financially in the fight against climate? Or there are many interesting questions and many more. Like, but I would like to ask this two questions. First of all, Ambassador Puri, if you are there, uh, there is one question, which is uh, why politicians rarely talk about global warming. Very interesting question. If you if you are there and she could uh, you know take this up. Second, Coel, I would come to you. Uh, this is one because it relates to what you also said. Now this question is uh, if. A lot is said about sustainable lifestyle, but if somebody does carpooling, then he or she is generally considered conduce. A very interesting comment by one of our school friends. It basically they are considered, uh, you know, conduce. You know, so now this is a mindset of the society, uh, and this is uh, kind of you know facing off against the desire for being uh, adopting a sustainable lifestyle. And your point about awareness, you made this point. So I would request you to you know address this particular dichotomy. That we are dealing with a society which maybe many times does not reward sustainable choices. Uh, so, what do we do about it? So, two questions, Professor uh, Ambassador Puri, first to you, and then I'll come to you, Kuya. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, well, thank, you. thank you very much. I must say, it's very nice. I heard with great interest what um, Kuya Kumarji said, and of course, Professor Jairaman, and he was so, so wonderful in explaining. And I hope uh, my young, young colleagues, you understood a lot of what Professor Jairaman said. Because, you know, as you grow and as India grows, you would come much more starkly to the point of realizing what this issue of equity, responsibilities, etc. are. Today, for many of us, we tend to look at things and say we almost accept it as the inevitability. But as the pressure on you starts growing. You start feeling it and start wanting to understand what exactly is happening. But let's leave me, let me leave that aside. Weber, this is a great question about politicians. My understanding is that a few years back, politicians did not mention this. But today, I don't think that they don't. Today, and I'm not talking of the developed world. In the developed world, climate change was one of the key issues in the US elections. With, uh, uh, featuring Biden and Trump, and you know which side won. And let me assure you that even this contributed a, a, a little bit to what happened in the results. Then, uh, in European countries, these parties have come to power. Look at what's happened in Germany. In India, look at our prime minister. Is this not mentioned by him at every single place we have elections on right now? Is this not part of what is said? Look, go renewable. Be sustainable. Look at water usage. Be more careful with that. Therefore, my understanding is that sustainability and climate are now integral buzzwords. Sometimes in the context of India, we may use it in terminology which people understand rather than the well-known technical terminology of mitigation, adaptation, common but differentiated. How do you explain this? across to people. But the basic ideas that be more economical in your usage of, of uh, energy, try and source more energy from renewable sources. This shall also be government policy. Try and go more electric. And above all, something that you started off this entire program with, that, you know, industry itself and the big parts of our economy are not going to have their wheels move 
if they don't move towards at least electrification, i.e. lowering the energy footprint and the fossil fuels and the greenhouse gas. So my understanding is that today it is integral. It is something which is there, perhaps not in so many words, but something which is extremely important. And I don't think 273 of these young people would have joined in if this wasn't something that their teachers were not talking about, if the school was not talking about, if the district education guys were not talking. I'm glad yeah. to see the change. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, for emphasizing this. I completely sure. agree. I think even net zero announcement wouldn't have really happened if our political leadership is taking this issue too lightly. I think they are considering it as one of the most important uh, issues of the current times. Thank you for reassuring this with this, this particular assessment of yours. Let me go, uh, Koyal, to you with this one question that related to what you had said. Uh, please, over to you, Koyal. Thanks, Bhavav. And I've been reading the chat box as well. Some amazing suggestion, great, great interaction and engagement there. Um, on the specific question you asked, I think that's a very um, interesting point, you know, the, uh, how society economy perceives us, our choices, our lifestyle. And I think it's not just at an individual level, even the way our economy is structured, right? If you make uh, choices such as recycling, reuse, it leads to lowering your GDP, your growth because you are using, giving your existing materials a longer life, you're reusing a lot of your resources, but eventually in the process, your, your GDP goes down. And this is because the way we define growth, you know, I'm a student of economics, when GDP was taught to us, it's, it's consumption plus investment plus expenditure. Consumption, the higher you consume, the more your GDP is, right? So as, a, as an economy, as a global economy, we are structured that way. But it is changing. The good news is it's changing, uh, even at an individual level. If you look at uh, a lot of the European countries, you see um, sort of not just incentives, but even public recognition given to these sustainable choices, right? Uh, in terms of your uh, the way your mobility choices are made, um, giving more leeway to pedestrians and bicycle riders than uh, motor vehicles, for example. And I think uh, in India, those choices will come as well. Um, I read a recent, I think, McKinsey report where it says that Indian companies now value uh, or employ, employees now value uh, environment, social, social and governance aspects, the ESG aspects more than anything else while joining a company. You know, so I think these changes are taking place, uh, albeit at a slower pace than we would all like to. But I think it all begins at how we perceive each other, right? Um, you know, if your friend is taking a shared um, commuting mode or, or taking the bicycle to work, it's also how we perceive each other. So I think let's start with that. I, for one, whenever my colleague takes a public transport or uh, bikes to, to work, I applaud that. I constantly tell my office that let's have that kind of infrastructure where people can come and take a shower if they are biking to work and then get to work. You know, we, we have these things in other countries. So I think it all starts with our own choices, uh, but definitely agree that, you know, th that that's a challenge we, we are grappling with and need to deal with. Great. Thank you so much, Kohl. So essentially, we do we want to promote public transportation. We do want to pr promote shared mobility, non-motorized transport, like bicycle that you said, and create infrastructure so that these choices are not looked down upon in the society as this particular question has uh, really challenged us uh, into thinking, but very important uh, response. Thank you, Koyal. Now, Professor Jairaman, any final comments from your side? Uh, well, you know, let me uh, just point out uh, to, especially uh, since we have a lot of younger colleagues here, one of the things sometimes uh, we don't see in the uh, climate discussion is debate. You know, so people think everybody has to say nice things. So, you know, if somebody says, oh, you should do this, everybody says, yes, yes. Then somebody says, oh, you must do this other thing. Then again, everybody says, yes, yes. So it's all a sort of goody, goody discussion, which is not, I am afraid, very useful. You don't learn anything unless you also disagree. It's a very important lesson, especially in the environment. So as an illustration to my listeners, I am going to disagree with Mr. Mandal right on the spot. So for India, so now you may consider the United States and you say, well, 
you know, you have so much growth, do you need more growth? Let them figure it out. As a matter of fact, I believe if they genuinely want to uh, be sustainable and they genuinely make their effort, their GDP will grow up because GDP is just a sum total of economic activity. So whether you do the activity green or your activity is not green, eh, does not matter to the accounting in GDP. Okay, so GDP is a bookkeeping device. And uh, so tilting and GDP is like tilting and windmills, I'm sorry. So for India, what is it? Suppose you take waste management. Uh, if, uh, your point, the point about structural uh, problems is very clear. I may want to have green garbage collection, but the garbage collection that is taking place in Mumbai, once corporation came and fined me and uh, others in my flat saying that you are supposed to separate the garbage to wet and dry. So you pay a fine, you are not doing it. So we will pay the fine. Then I told our uh, maid who helps us put the garbage away. Uh, she, so I said, Mine paisa diya, make sure you know a rule hai, wet and dry. She said, Saab aap pagal hai. Oh, gadi mein le ja ke sab ek hi jaga, but truck mein ek hi saath dalte hai. So you see, unless an arrangement is made for people to exercise the right behavior, the right behavior by itself is no use. Chennai may in Mumbai, if any child of mine wants to ride a cycle, I'll get a heart attack. How will you ride a cycle? So structural change is important and making structural change in a country like India is far from easy. So I think a lot of this is not easy solution. So we have to have a process of learning by doing and we have to challenge and think for ourselves, you can accept good things that you know who said yes. no. But we have that, to yeah, think no. for ourselves and critically take what the world is talking about. And out of that, take the solutions that uh, we works for us and that we would like to have. Let me stop here. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for uh, rekindling the spirit of debate. I don't think there was much disagreement uh, uh, in what you and Coel said, but uh, but I think, yes, this debate is uh, always on. It's great to hear these diverging perspectives, if there are any. Uh, uh, let me, uh, we're already overshot a bit of time. So uh, thank you so much. For, unless, Koyal, you want to come in, uh, I can see you uh, nodding your head. Uh, otherwise, we will close this. No, okay, no, no, sounds good. Thank, uh, my side. Th thank you so much. Great. So thank you a lot for all the panelists, uh, Ambassador Puri, uh, Professor Jairaman, and Koyal. Thank you for joining today. We do have uh to uh youth interviews lined up so uh, would you be taking it up uh, Taru, uh, uh or how should we go about doing that uh yes uh, dr chaturvedi i'll be announcing their names and introducing okay. them maybe uh then uh any of you could you know answer answer the students okay sounds good. and i would also okay. request the speakers that if you see the chat and if you want to reply in the chat itself that will be great because yeah. uh, we won't be able to take individual questions uh, during the session. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chaturvedi, for moderating the session and giving uh, so many perspective uh, to the to the larger debate. Uh, and thank you to all the speakers for bringing in fresh perspectives. Uh, moving on, okay. uh, we now have. Uh, we now have youth interviews wherein uh, we have two stalwarts with us who have done extraordinary work in uh, environment protection in the past and even in the present. And uh, they would they have some two, one or two questions, two, three questions to the speakers. So welcoming uh, Argadeep Das. He is a recent graduate from National Law University and Ms. Mahira Ahuja, who is a school student from Don Bosco Senior Secondary School, uh, Mumbai. Uh, Students, over to you. Who will go first? I think Argadeep will go first. Okay, all right. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Argadeep Das, and I'm delighted to be speaking as a youth representative. Uh, thank you, distinguished panelists, for your insightful thoughts on climate change science and sustainable responses towards achieving net zero. On that background, my question to the speakers is uh, 
did the global community respond uh, adequately to the findings of the sixth assessment report of IPCC? And what was the response from developed and developing countries? Very important and loaded question. Which which of the panelists would like to volunteer? Uh, Ambassador Puri, I can I see you. So I'm uh, now that you, you know, I thought that let's try and address people, get them to do something. But you ask this question. <laughs> Professor Jeraman was also there in Glasgow. I was there for a little while. He was very much part of the Indian delegation. So I'm sure he may wish to chip in. But let me make a point very simple too. Let's start with Glasgow and the sixth IPCC, since you know we have now raised ourselves at that level. There was four years of high tests on international action on climate in terms of these negotiations. People were doing their own things. After all, Elon Musk was developing his electric car. The research on uh, fusion energy was going on. People are doing their own thing. India was doing its own thing on uh, renewables. We set up the International Solar Alliance. We've been pushing it. All countries were doing their own thing, barring one country. Uh, but internationally, there was a high test. The man went, the height has changed. This is the way global polity works. I think you, we have to understand this. And you studied international law. Let me tell you, international law is actually international power play. Domestic law is law in the sense it remains in every country in the world. Uh, so much so for all of this. But you know, that's perfectly fine. Now, what did the developed world do? Let's start with what they wanted. Let's look at it. One, they wanted, for a variety of reasons, something should be done to coal. And let's be very clear, the main reason, although the United States does consume a lot of coal, in fact, its per capita coal energy consumption is double that of India, it still feels that it's moving in the direction of hydrocarbons. And therefore, some element of taking a hit on coal is possible. Who are the countries most hit? It would be India. They think it would be China, but then they entered a deal with the Chinese to see, you know, what we can do. So coal push was one thing. In India, let me tell you, whichever way I may think or not, but issues regarding coal and more energy coming from coal will become an issue for India, and I think they've already become an issue. There's no doubt. So, you know, there's a hit and push to use uh, Coel and uh, Professor Jeremy's analogies of how GDP is calculated. There's a hit. I mean, let's understand that. Let's look at, let me, I'll take a few minutes and let's take all the points. This business of net zero. So where have I been talking about it? But you know what the goal was? It was not that the world will be net zero by 2050. The goal will be every country will go net zero by 2050. It's like saying the United States and India should take the same target. That was deliberately done. Everybody knows it. So even though we announced 2070, the fact of the matter is the buy went to the developed world because they should have been net zero in 2030. And that was the requirement. If the world had gone net zero by 2050 and common and differentiated responsibility, they'd have to do it now. They didn't do it. We know that. Now, there are several other issues which happened, but let me take the case of finance. They brazenly said, we are sorry we didn't do anything. Then how does that matter, man? Thank you very much for being sorry. Kuch karenge, answer is absolutely zilch. Or for the larger developing countries, we should be quite clear in our mind, nahi karenge. You will have only the market, which means they gain, you may gain, they gain. That's the nature of global power. So, you know, you raised a very important question. We talk about these things. I think it's very important for people, especially someone like you, to understand what is policy space. So what you do in India, let's say we are talking about India, what we do in India is our business. We should be more mindful of the world. We should take the maximum actions, whatever we can do. But let's not have actions taken as a result of having been squeezed internationally. That's the nature of ensuring that there is policy space to take action. What is the nature of global climate negotiations? It is international burden sharing. It's not do the right thing. The do the right thing is happening on its own. International burden sharing. And there the emphasis always has been. From the heydays of the 1990s, when in a unique time in the global society, where there was only one G1 and they agreed to everything like common but differentiated responsibility, one vote, one country. They've clawed back on every single one of those particular things. And now they say, oh, historical responsibility, sorry, my granddad wasn't good, you know, let's just forget about it. And let's go on now. So now we are the worst guys. Uh, very crazy, man. Look at where we are and where we are, but we are the worst guys. That's the nature of the game. 
I thought, I let me put it very colorfully. I'm sure you've got the hint, you've got the facts, and I'm sure the others who are interested at this level of understanding that these are strategic talks. These are global talks and they are about power play. If this fact gets understood, in the West, everyone knows it, let me explain. They know what they are doing. And even, and so I'm not saying these are platitudes, but that's the nature of it. It's in the developing world. Because why? We are growing in nation states. So many of the things take some, take some time. These theories were not involved with us. We are getting to know them. That's the nature of the game. I, Great. Let's have some fun. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Puri, for this very passionate response. And I think, uh, yes, we completely agree that the developed nations have uh, not really done what expected and increasingly they are now you know ceding what the the their responsibility that is very very clear on the global scale which is very very unfortunate to so completely agree with you on on the very important comments you have made about this global climate politics and the criticality of low cost finance for the climate debate in india thank you again for emphasizing that uh, let me go to uh, mahira you please ask your question good evening to everyone present here i am mahira ahuja a student in class 9 from Don Bosco Senior Secondary School, Nerul Navi, Mumbai. My question is as follows. All the sectors will have to adopt stringent measures for cutting down emissions. What will the world look like in a net zero world? Thank you. Yes, the who? Well, that's for you, man. Well, you that's for you, put in all this. <laughs> Morning. I think that that's the best question I've heard today. Um, very interesting. And I'll, I'll also like to pose this question. It's almost like a thought experiment, right? Uh, I think we should all close our eyes for a few seconds. And let me also rephrase the question. Let's remove the word net zero. Let's do this thought experiment. How do we want our future to be? Let's just close our eyes and think what, what kind of future we, we want our planet to look like, right? Um, I was again talking to someone in the morning. I, The first thing I do in the morning is do pranayama. In Delhi, it's lethal to do pranayama in the morning because of bad air quality in Delhi, right? Then you beat the traffic, you, all the dust and the concrete and all of that, you you reach your office. Um, then of course, the, the, the heat outside is increasing. Then your pesticide laden food that you consume, right? Um, the lack of, the diminishing public space in your urban areas, the garbage everywhere that you see in your cities, et cetera. So I think for all of us, this is the life we lead. And I think we should all pause and take a moment to reflect what kind of future we want uh, ourselves, you know, what we see ourselves in, and then see whether a net zero world aligns with that future. And if you ask me that question, I think a lot of what net zero economy will look like, society will look like, aligns to what you know how i would like society my physical environment to be it's not an easy choice it's not going to happen just because someone made a commitment these are very difficult choices uh, it's not just a technology and economic solution it's a movement of a billion people in india um, people that depend on the fossil fuel industry for their jobs for their livelihoods today uh, they will need to you know look at a totally different lifestyle tomorrow do they have the skill sets? How can government support them? How can we all act together? So I think these are very difficult choices, difficult questions, social, political, economic, all of them align. But I would still, I think, request all of us to really reflect on the question you have asked and think very critically because, you know, not to make it philosophical, but what we do think is what ultimately materializes. So, thank, thank you. you. Oh, my God. Uh, Weber, give me a minute. Yes. My yes, God, this was a beautiful, philosophical, and wishful answer given by Koyla and I like. But let me be very practical and prosaic. I don't think there'll be much changes. So let's look at some simple things. All that will happen is, by and large, the source of fuel will be carbonless. So whether the newspaper report of yesterday that the first time some fusion seems to have made it, I don't know whether it will happen in 30 years or 40 years, but hydrogen economy may come on. So, you know, these kind of changes will happen. Uh, people before you, the generations before you, were shouting into a telephone and making a call. And you are now doing it on internet and it's free of cost, etc. But it's only communication, isn't it? People are sending letters by post for a generation. 
things will change. They may move at an accelerated or other way. One of the things that people talk about, and I want to talk about simple things, is where will you get your protein from? So much is being said that animal protein causes a lot of this issue. But you think we won't get protein? We'll get it from plant-based methods. We'll find ways of extracting it. So many of the things, and I personally way that the way human beings will interact, global power play, et cetera, is not going to change. It hasn't changed before. And in 30, 40 years, there's going to be no change. Technologically, we'll be able to do the same things differently. And that's what is going to happen. So, you know, your car will be electric driven, damn good. How does it matter whether it's run with petrol or not? It matters to the atmosphere, it matters to a cleaner atmosphere, etc. But, you know, the human mind has caused all of it. I'm sure it will find its solutions. And I do think the planet is under stress, but it is we who stressed it and we'll find the solution. So, you know, when a little hopeful, contribute in your own way till such time as there's a tectonic technological revolution which changes everything, brings in hydrogen fuel or fusion or whatever it is. Till that time, be a little more careful yourself in terms of your contribution. I don't want to use the word our individual pollution. What happens? Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Puri. And uh, let me also say, I mean, Ambassador Puri gave a very practical kind of answer, but what Koel said is profoundly important. Uh, we should definitely at times take, you know, think, close our eyes and think through. Uh, because only after being mindful, we will be able to make these very, very important and critical choices of the future. And just to, you know, uh, just to close this session, I think what is really jumped out from all the arguments that have been made, and thank you, Argudeep and Mahira, for your very important and interesting questions. The three things that have jumped out for me, that, that uh, the first is about, well, this global power play, as Ambassador Puri said, will continue to go. You know, that will always happen, right? The second thing is there's always this right thing to do. You know, irrespective of whatever global power politics keeps on happening, there is always something that is like the right thing to do. We have to be mindful of that. You know, what is the right thing to do? Right. The third is what is really, you know, what is the choice that will make India a strategic leader? Right now, so the, the real choices will be shaped by these three things. One is what is the global power politics happening? Second is what should a, you know, strategically a leader should do, an emerging leader uh, like country like India should do. And the third is what is the right thing to do? What is the ethically right thing to do? And that these three things will probably, you know, help us determine and make more kind of sensible choice to go ahead uh, in this world. With this very interesting discussion, we, as always, we love talking to all the friends from the school. And thank you, uh, Terry and uh, the speaker project for inviting all of us here. Uh, over, over to you, uh, Tharu. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chaturvedi, for um, ha having uh, on the platform again this year. And it was really, you know, uh, motivating for all of us to listen to all the speakers and to you. Thank you so much. So uh, we now move on to the quiz. And I promise that I would not take very long. This quiz is organized just so that we can check your knowledge now that you have gathered, gathered from the session. And we want to see whether you've understood all of it or, or there are still some gray areas left. So, um, program, uh, Joe, sir, can we have the uh, quiz, please? Robert, please start. Sir, are you started the quiz? Will I be able to see it or I just speak the question? Starting it. I still don't see a question on my screen. Uh, so there will be a set of five questions that will come one by one on your screen. You need to select the option which you think is correct. Uh, and if it is not being able 
to you know come on screen we can do it maybe later because we are anyway uh, running out of time rahul josh sir can you confirm is qg is already shared to all the participants and panelists all participants and uh, you can see and uh, it will answer to me I, can you please say check your whatsapp Uh, maybe we can move ahead with the agenda and have the quiz later. Have yeah, because more. even I am getting uh, my messages on the chat that even students cannot see. Are not so, able to access. Uh, yeah. Let's 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 just move on. Apologies for this uh, inconvenience. Uh, moving on. Uh, in this particular session, we also have a, a video message from. Uh, from our experts uh, from the World Bank group. Uh, the video message is shared by Mr. Abhaz Jha, Practice Manager, Climate Change and Disaster Risk Management, South Asia Region, World Bank Group. Um, would request you to please uh, screen the video. Yeah. Change and disaster risk management for the World Bank's South Asia region. It gives me great pleasure to be able to record this message for the youth climate conclave. Uh, we are living in a perilous time. Um, as you know, uh, in Glasgow, um, at the Conference of Parties, the COP26 last year, the pledges that were made, uh, the best scientific evidence shows that if all these pledges are met, uh, the world is still on track uh, to uh, on uh, to warm 2.4 to 2.7 degrees centigrade. The effects of that is going to be catastrophic. We cannot afford a world that is two degrees warmer. Please increase the volume yes, at the back. That the youth like yourself have a critical role to play. Um, you can really make a difference. Uh, we have watched with admiration the movement started by Greta Thunberg. The Fridays for the Future uh, meetings that she started has mobilized millions of people, most of them young people, uh, to uh, take action on climate. I, it is my hope that uh, meetings like these and many others will mobilize many more people uh, and many more young people to participate. Uh, you can make a difference by raising awareness, by mobilizing your friends, your family, uh, to try and influence policymakers to take decisive action on climate. The second area I would uh, highlight is on uh, careers in climate change. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of exciting work that is currently underway in areas like, for example, scientific research, technological research on better batteries, on, on solar and wind and geothermal energy, um, on uh, designing climate resilient uh, seeds, uh, designing a climate smart food system, these are all areas where we need the best and the brightest uh, to, to join. Um, and I hope that meetings like these will uh, inspire and mobilize uh, people to uh, work in this area uh, to make a difference. So uh, let me conclude by wishing the event great success. And I hope that uh, this will really lead uh, you and your uh, people around you uh, to ins be inspired and uh, join the climate movement. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, last but not the least, we have uh, our youth speaker, Mr. Aditya Mukherjee. Uh, he is an Indian youth who has represented uh, 
our country at Milan in COP26. Let us hear his experiences. Let us hear what he has done uh, for, on climate action. Over to you, Aditya. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I was part of the earlier Terry uh, conference where we where you guys launched the working document from the conclave you guys had had. It was wonderful to see the hard work that fellow youth had put in and the dedication they had shown and the uh, research capabilities they had shown. Uh, I did take those points with me to Milan. However, we were not able to incorporate them in the final working document. Uh, like the ambassador had said, it's international relations is all about power play and uh, the voice of uh, the developing countries were being subdued by the developed countries who felt that they were doing everything right and we were doing everything uh, wrong. So at uh, Milan, I was uh, one of the representatives uh, from India and I, my primary purpose was to uh, present the viewpoint of climate change and climate action from India's perspective and to fight to include points that would benefit India directly in the final working document which would be uh, which was introduced at COP26 and accepted by the uh, nations present. So what was the thing? I uh, particularly worked on uh, financial uh, climate finance towards sustainable uh, lifestyle uh, and sustainable uh, and sustainable economy as well as green jobs and green energy. One of the uh, main things that I fought for, which is very important in uh, develop in the developing world, is green jobs because as we switch from uh, fossil fuels to renewables, we are going to remove a huge portion of our uh, workforce. They will be unemployed and. Uh, will not have skills necessary to switch over to a renewable field or to any other industry. So at that point, uh, that what I suggested has been taken in through the, uh, was included in the working document was the fact that we should have uh, skill-based training for all people engaged in this fossil fuel industry and in uh, the climate negative uh, industries so as to give them some training and tangible skills that they can take across to other industries when we finally transition away from fossil fuels, away from climate negative uh, practices. And uh, second is to, was to give them uh, a financial aid during the time of employment. Then we come to the climate finance. One of the major things that uh, was a winner from India's perspective was trying to fight for proper developmental goals and proper targets for uh, removal of uh, fossil fuels to achieve net zero. So I, I was reading in the Q&A that someone was asking what is uh, net zero. So net zero is when uh, uh, we have been able to achieve a target wherein the amount of carbon dioxide we release and carbon releasing into the atmosphere is equal to the amount of carbon we're extracting from it. And that was uh, and to ensure that we, uh, I fought for and finally were able to include in the fact that uh, 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 developing world uh, nations cannot be uh, put to the same pedestal as a developed country because we have various other factors such as poverty, such as uh, uh, overpopulation, such as uh, uh, low, poorer, uh, smaller economies, uh, which will struggle to cope with uh, an immediate switch. I'm not talking about India particularly, but all developing countries. This switch needs uh, was something that was difficult. So what we did was we fought and we got different targets at so 2030 for developed, 2045 for developing and so on and so forth. Well, one of the major things that uh, was ha that happened at COP26 was that India vowed to uh, go carbon neutral, not uh, net zero, but carbon neutral. We will not have any carbon production by about uh, 2070 with net zero by 2030. This is a major step from India's perspective for we have always tried to sideline discussions on coal as that is our primary source of energy. Now, we can't keep sidelining things. And that's what the government realized when the prime minister made that statement. And uh, we are also working towards various other aspects of climate protection. We signed the deforestation 
back to prevent deforestation. Uh, we have we are going to ban single-use plastics from now on, from 2022, and several other steps, which were all uh, brought up at uh, in Milan and were lauded by uh, the other delegates. Thank you. Thank you, Aditya, for your presence and for uh, addressing the uh, youth participants. We now move on to our next session, session two, the Indian Act session, adaptation and mitigation. The speaker and moderator of the session is Dr. Ashish Chaturvedi, Director, Climate Change, GIZ India. We welcome you, sir. Our speakers for the session are Dr. Arunabha Ghosh, CEO, Council on Energy, Environment and Water, Ms. Seema Arora, Deputy Director General CII, Dr. Indu K. Murthy, Sector Head, Climate, Environment and Sustainability, CISTE. I request Dr. Ashish Chaturvedi to please take forward the proceedings from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Taru. Uh, and uh, delighted to be here, back here uh, for the Youth Climate Conclave. It's become a fixture, a very important fixture in our annual calendar. And uh, I'm delighted that we are partnering with Terry uh, as well as the European Union delegation to organize this event. And of course, CEW has also been associated with this right from the very inception. Uh, you've heard in the previous session about science, uh, about the science of climate change, what's uh, sort of the, the, the big discussions and the negotiations on how science could actually influence uh, the the dialogue on net zero, as well as on the need for action. And I think we should really now sort of, uh, in this session, the way it's conceptualized is that we're actually going to talk about what is happening on the ground in India. Uh, how are we acting on climate uh, change, uh, on mitigation, as well as on adaptation? What is the, what are the initiatives of the private sector? What are the initiatives of the government of India? Uh, and uh, what could be priorities for action, given the fact that we have the leading thinkers, uh, leading experts who've been working on this topic for several years in this country. We can also hope to hear from them on what could be priorities for action in the next, well, in this decade for action, to be honest, uh, but to be also immediately in the next couple of years. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to kind of hand over to the panelists. Uh, I have, uh, uh, sort of Arunabha Ghosh, uh, who's uh, one of the most well-known uh, policy advisors we have on climate in this country. Um, and he's been working very closely with uh, the government of India, but also with other governments around the world uh, on these uh, sort of vexed issues, but also on priorities for action. So Arunabha, you'll have 10 minutes to talk about what we could do. And then we'll move on to uh, as in the Seema Arora. Uh, who is uh, the Deputy Director General at the Confederation of Indian Industries and uh, someone who's actually been uh, well, not only working with industry, but also pushing industry uh, to, to sort of uh, expand action on climate. And I think uh, we would really sort of uh, hope to hear from you on what's happening. What do you think are the views of the industry and what have been major initiatives? And then we move on to Mrs. Uh, Dr. Indu Murthy, who's at C-STEP. She's been doing a lot of work on adaptation as well. So Dr. Murthy, it would be great to hear from you on adaptation priorities, but also very broadly on the narratives of uh, action on the ground uh, at the community level, at the scientific level, but also at the policy level. So without further ado, uh, I'm handing over to Arunabha. You have 10 minutes uh, and then uh, the other speakers will have 10 minutes each and then we'll get to the question and answer. All right, over to you Arunabha. Great, thank you so much, uh, Ashish and uh... Good afternoon to everybody and uh, 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 hello to my co-panelists. Uh, this is, after all, now the second year running uh, that we are having this conversation in a virtual setting, uh, of course, but as Ashish was saying, the, the youth conclave in January, February has become a feature of the calendar. But why am I referring to this virtual setting? Because it is demonstrating both the tragedy of our work of 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 hu humans impact on the planet and the opportunity of you know humans ingenuity uh, the fact that we can bring upon ourselves a planetary shock in the form of the pandemic um, is a sign of that tragedy 
the fact that we can still con you know have civilized debate through virtual settings and find avenues to keep the conversation and action going is a sign of our ingenuity. So if we are having this discussion in February 2022, uh, what will the world look like in February 2023, let alone in February 2017, right? Uh, and I think the previous panel was also, you know, Coel had some very nice reflections on imagining a, a different world. So really what I wanted to bring to the table just as getting the conversation started is that when we think about India's actions, whether it's on adaptation or on mitigation, uh, to me, the question is not just what are the actions. Right? Uh, to me, the bigger question increasingly when we talk about the youth, because a lot of uh, the agenda for the future will be driven by the youth. My own daughter will be approaching her retirement age, and she is only nine, uh, when we hope to achieve net zero. So it is her career and people like her who will drive this transformation. So to me, the two other big questions is not just the what, but the why and the how. But let's just focus on the what for a second, right? Uh, even before Glasgow, India had been a front runner in climate action. Our national action plan way back in 2008 had several missions, one of which was the solar mission that kicked off in 2010. Another important mission was the one on energy efficiency uh, and especially the uh, perform achievement trade scheme that kicked off in 2012 for, for large industries. And we can list several such actions that India had undertaken. And then of course, the renewable energy targets ramped up in 2014, then again, they ramped up in 2019, 2020, and then formalized in 2021. Uh, to that Glasgow meeting then, India brought forward several more ideas and commitments in the form of what the prime minister called the Panchamrit. Uh, one of them, of course, is the net zero target of net zero emissions by 2070. But the near-term targets are as significant, 500 gigawatts of renewables or non-fossil capacity in the electricity sector. Just to put that in context, that basically means that India is going to build out more renewables than its entire electricity system. No other major economy on the planet has done that ever. They've done it in the margins. We are upturning the whole story. Uh, a billion tons of emissions reductions by 2030 in absolute terms. That from our uh, projected trajectory would be in our estimation about a 3% reduction. 3% might seem small, but when you compare it to the uh, advanced economies that since 1990 have reduced emissions by only 3.7%, it's a very aggressive target. So we can keep going through, uh, through the one or the other, and, and I'm sure some of this will come up in the in the q a as well but i don't want to delve on just listing out these these actions what i do want to dwell, dwell on is a little bit on the why and the how why should we be acting because on multiple forums we can still hear well it was someone else's fault we don't need to do it do enough i mean it's not our responsibility etc those voices have of course come down but I don't think we have truly internalized the scale of the crisis we are dealing with. Settled human civilization has never experienced what the planet is going to go through this, this century. So there, there is no human history or prehistory that tells us how to deal with a warming of more than two degrees or more than three degrees above pre-industrial levels and everything that goes with it. The climate models that were predicting certain things that would happen in 2050 are we are now seeing is happening now. Our estimation at CW is that now three quarters of India's districts are hotspots for extreme climate events. We're losing tens of billions of dollars in our GDP, in our national income because of climate related impacts. We are going to lose upwards of trillion dollars and more in terms of just agricultural output losses in the coming decades. 
So the why is not about the international negotiations. It is not about the power politics. As much as all that is important, the why is because we have to survive in a manner that no other forefather or foremother of ours has actually managed to do thus far. So we have to find a different way, which brings me to the how. I think we need to rethink a little bit about how we internalize and incorporate and, and mainstream climate action into our national and subnational policies differently from what we have done in the past. 2022 is 30 years since the 1992 Rio conventions, one of which was the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Now, in this time, has the planet become more sustainable? The answer is no. And Einstein said, if you keep uh, repeating the same thing again and again, expecting a different result, it's a sign of insanity. So my proposal is that the how of climate action has to change, starting with the international level. The UN framework on climate change has served as a bank of commitments. Every year, countries come and put in more commitments. I believe it has to change into a bank of actions. At least three quarters of those two weeks that we spend every year in COPS should be about measuring and accounting for actions taken, not new promises made. Remember, almost exactly 80 years ago, Sir Stafford Cripps came to India on a mission promising dominion status for India after the Second World War if the freedom fighters of India would give support to the war effort. Gandhiji famously said, this was a promise of, uh, this was a post dated check on a failing bank. I believe that the UNFCCC could become a failing bank if it continues to be a bank of commitments rather than our actions. And what is the sign of a failing bank? It means that you lose trust of the depositors. The same countries that are depositing commitments will see that other depositors are not acting on those commitments and there will be a run on the bank. So we have to shift towards actions rather than keep promising post dated checks on failing banks. The other thing that we have to do, however, is nationally. We have to start incorporating all our international promises into national and subnational legislation. If we don't do that, who's to hold ourselves to account? Who's to hold our political leaders to account? Who's to hold the youth of today who might become political leaders in 2030, 2040 to account? Are you keeping us on track to net zero by 2070? We need a legislative and institutional framework. And finally, I know my, I'm into my 10th minute. Finally, we have to completely change ourselves at an individual level, which means lifestyles, but not without aspirations. So how can sustainable lifestyle become aspiration, aspirational? How can a circular economy become the economy? How can recycling become part of everything that we do, not as an afterthought? How can critical minerals be sourced from recycling the motherboard of this laptop from on which I'm speaking, rather than digging up more mines? That transformation in how we imagine the economy has to change. Uh, again, a long time ago, but nearly a century ago, Bertrand Russell uh, had talked about work as simply being something about rearranging material near the Earth's surface. And that's true. Everything that we do, this jacket I'm wearing, the food I eat, the computer I use, is just a rearrangement of materials near the Earth's surface. But in doing that, 
we have transformed the planet for the worse. Let's start rearranging our ideas, our legislations, our commitments, our actions, and ourselves near the Earth's surface before we shoot for the moon. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Arnava, very much. Uh, it's, it's always a great pleasure to listen to you. And uh, I think uh, the fact that you kind of, in addition to focusing on the what, you also talked about the why and the how, and very persuasively, I'm sure the students would listen, the, the audience would listen, and maybe we'll have, they'll have some questions for you uh, as we go along. Uh, so let's move on to uh, uh, Seema, uh, who's uh, been working with CII. And uh, Seema, the floor is yours, and you have 10 minutes too. Good evening, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, uh, this is very interesting to have a conversation with the the future, as I call it, because we are the past anyways, and uh, we are trying to tinker with the future, but anyway, I'll make an attempt. So, um, I think, uh, uh, importantly, Anurabha already has, you know, really painted a very useful context. I will try and focus uh, mainly on, uh, you know, um, why and what the industry in India is trying to do, uh, and uh, maybe what more can be done, and how a little bit. Um, so, I mean, uh, uh, Arava mentioned it's 30 years since uh, Rio and it's true and it's been 30 years since at least in CII, we have been trying to push our membership to work in this uh, area. It hasn't been easy uh, because, um, you know, the default position is always uh, that, uh, you know, I really don't do anything. I don't really contribute much to this problem and, you know, somebody else contributes. So that that's where we started from, let's put it this way, 30 years ago, but we are very happy and proud that a lot of the front runners of industry really took um, uh, this upon themselves because I would say they they could realize the uh, existential crisis that we are heading towards, right? We all know it is really an existential crisis and um, industry uh, can pick these, uh, you know, I would say trends much faster than some of the other stakeholders simply because they are exposed to many more things and are a part of this global you know, economy, as we are saying, and we say that the, it's a flat earth and, you know, everybody's connected. So they pick this up much faster than others. And we saw this, uh, you know, and together with the, the CII also, you know, pushing them uh, by, you know, really exposing them to some of these concepts. We saw that the industry uh, did realize they started with more efficiency oriented things. And this is a bit of a past, which is energy efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, managing resources better. Uh, and more in, more looking at it from a, like you manage your finances and you manage your HR. So how do you manage your environment, et cetera, you know, and environmental performance. But soon we saw the real interest in issues which were more strategic. And we also pushed for it. And that's how it built. The strategic issues got linked to climate also. And now very clearly in the last five years, I can say that we see a lot of interest from industry and a lot of real uh, I would say change in the way they used to deal with issues related to climate change. Uh, it was denial mostly about five, seven years ago. Uh, and now it is more that, okay, where do I, where, what do I do to take care of the risks and what are my opportunities as well? So both. So that is the good part that the conversation has shifted from denial to only looking for how do I hedge my risks? How do I manage my risk? But also to looking at what are the opportunities? And I think therein lies really a bigger piece of the conversation that we should also have uh, because um, it's it's as Arunava said the it will be the ingenuity and the innovation of all of us as stakeholders uh, that will bring us out of this problem and that's where the opportunity really lies yeah yes we must put all the you know the structures in place so that we push towards that opportunity Again, this blame about who created the problem. I mean, it is okay to go on at the international level for whatever reasons and for having a fair share, it's fine. But if we have to solve the problem, it is really important that we start looking for the changes that we need to bring in and technological changes, innovation is going to be one of our key levers, which I believe industry is now very, very seriously looking at. And uh, I also believe there's, there's, there is, lot of pressure on them from, um, I would say, regulation so far is not too much of a pressure on them, and I wish there would be more. And to that, I think Arunabha's point is correct, that if what we make commitments internationally, 
if we were to weave them into our national legislation, there would be more accountability. Uh, of course, the legislation has to be designed well. It should not be designed in a manner that just, you know, you are just trying to tick the box or it's the lowest possible denominator. So that's a, another challenge that we always have when we design legislations that it should really spur action and raise aspiration for action. I think the second box, that, that point that's very important here is the whole thing about financing this uh, change because a lot of money would be required. And I know a lot of you know that, you know, when this COVID thing has struck us, uh, I mean, look at the amount of, you know, money that has gone into, uh, you know, taking care of this pandemic and we still aren't out of it, of course, but, you know, people have poured in money because they realize that for a challenge like this, you really need to stand together and say, okay, this is what I uh, uh, would put on the table. Here, of course, in the international negotiations, we know there are some promises, the promise box, the bank that Arunapa talked about, but I'm more talking about how do we generate, uh, you know, uh, the uh, investments into newer areas of opportunity and innovation. So one is what we can get from other people, but I think, or the outside communities, et cetera, and the developed countries, but as a nation itself, and I think here again, we have to make those changes structurally because we still continue to invest in, uh, you know, solutions of the past, if I may put it that way, rather than solutions of the future. So we have to really structurally change the way we are even so even if you look at the budget, I mean, it's a good budget and we all want to say it's a good budget and, and budget should not be only the barometer, but any kind of, you know, schemes that the government brings out, any kind of investments that government makes, because government is the largest investor. I think the signals are to be made very clear now that there is no investment that should spur, uh, you know, investment for in technologies of the past. It has to be only technologies of the future. It has to be how we overcome this problem. So I think this is where another big thrust has to come. I think industry is ready. The direction has to come from policy and the mainstream financial sector has to think differently. And I think a big piece of our work now has to be, so whether it is for mitigation or it is for adaptation, uh, money is required, right? And the financial sector has to really change the way they are looking at this whole climate angle, you know. Even now, I think there is Internationally, there's a push. We hear of the the whole ESG debate, and you know uh, uh, the investors wanting to look at how companies are doing on ESG before they, you know, uh, invest. But I think still more needs to be done. It should not become a only a mere tick box and a green washing that you can show things and you can uh, pull money. We need to really put those right structures in place and really say that we are changing course here, as Arunaba said. If you have to transition to a circular economy without investing in that, you cannot transition to a circular economy. And the entire, you know, the entire uh, tax structure, for example, needs to change, right? If you have to transition to a circular economy, you can, you have to tax completely differently and then make that shift happen. So this is where we have to really think of the fundamental shifts that we have to make. And the final point I want to make is so regulation, the financing, the investment, the, everything needs to change. Final is the power of the consumer. And here, I think it's really the youth here, which are our audience. And I really think that they have so much power and leverage. See, any, any industry uh, would uh, go towards what the consumer is pulling them to do. And if the consumer pull is strong, the financer and the financing investor will also be pulled into that. And that's how the company actually changes behavior. So I think, uh, you know, each one of us, and each one of us, and include especially the young consumers, because they are much more aware, and we know that they have much more ability to, you know, express their desires through this new digital and social media and all these, uh, you know, platforms that we have created. I think we need to use these, this, uh, you know, uh, power of the youth to get companies to change their behavior, to get the governments to change their behaviors as well, to get. Uh, you know, regulation to be in the right direction. So I think there's a huge responsibility on us as individuals and particularly the young people who still have to, as Arunabha was saying, you know, live their life and they have to suffer this existential crisis and they must voice the opinion now and make this requirement. I, I give simple examples. I mean, uh, if we are able to create a pull for, uh, you know, uh, companies and products which are 
good for the planet and they are plenty and they don't have to be poor in quality. They don't have to be expensive also. They may be marginally expensive to begin with, but it's if there's enough demand, they will not remain expensive for a long time, right? LEDs is an example, so many examples. So I don't want to really <laughs> go into there, but if we were, and the, it should not always be driven only by government, right? If we can also as consumers drive it, I think the power of the consumer is really, really strong. I mean, you you know that, you know, you can make uh, companies uh, change uh, uh, their taglines as as powerful consumers. There's enough recent evidence as well. So I think I would uh, want to, uh, you know, uh, exhort our uh, young, uh, you know, audience to really look at this uh, seriously and not do it as as terrorism or extremism of any kind. It is really for the cause and for making sure that we are able to push our trajectory in, in the way we are looking at this issue in the right direction. So I'll end here and happy to have a conversation later. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Seema, very much uh, for bringing in the perspective of the industry, but a broader perspective as well on what could be uh, the incentive structures for companies to act, but also the, the reforms that we need, might need in the, well, the tax structures, but also in the financial industry and, uh, and of course, financial regulation as well. The, the economic survey this year has a chapter, and it's been recently that they started doing it, that they have a chapter on climate change and sustainable development. And uh, that actually has a section now exclusively on sustainable finance. And it's rather instructive. And of course, uh, there are certain initiatives in which some of us are already involved on sustainable finance, but also on ESG, on the SEBI sort of guidelines on reporting and uh, business and sustainability reporting. But I think much more needs to be done if we really want to accelerate action. Uh, and the, from that perspective, from like sort of changing the incentive structures uh, for businesses to actually enable much more action and act uh, as well. And also, thanks very much for bringing in the consumer perspective. I think we have a fairly large audience who is going to be the big, who are going to be making the big consumption choices in the future. And uh, many thanks for highlighting that point as well. Uh, let's move on to uh, Dr. Murthy, uh, who's been uh, working on a lot of issues related to vulnerability assessments on methodologies for adaptation, uh, sort of monitoring and planning at the local level. And it would be great to hear from you, but yeah, not restricting only to adaptation fairly broadly as well. So over to you, Dr. Murthy, and you have 10 minutes as well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ashish, and uh, happy to be here back at the Youth Conclave uh, uh, second year in a row as well, and uh, it's it's actually a wonderful opportunity to uh, talk about the issues uh, which are at the heart of, uh, you know, the future of everybody here, particularly the youth. So I think very nicely articulated by both uh, Arnaba and uh, uh, Seema, and even the panel before that, which talked about, you know, net zero, the context, what happened, uh, you know, India stands so on and so forth. Uh, so, I mean, given that, you know, that perspective is already in place, I, I would like to kind of focus on, uh, you know, I, I'm sure there are questions around, you know, so, okay, fine, we know that there is a problem, what are we doing about it? Uh, and uh, Seema very nicely articulated about, you know, from the industry perspective, what are the different uh, things that are actually being put forth? Arunaba talked about the, the policy, uh, you know, it, uh, relevance of it and how India has already been doing quite a bit with or without actually the, uh, you know, the net zero commitment also, India already had started working in that particular direction. Uh, but, uh, you know, coming to the problem of climate change, it's it's quite interesting in the sense, you know, when we whenever we talk about global negotiations as such, uh, we, are, we are kind of more focused on the mitigation aspect and, uh, you know, because that's a more tangible kind of uh, the difference that it can bring about. And it's very important also, and also the case of differentiated responsibilities, who is responsible, who needs to do what comes in. Now, of course, when you when we are talking about uh, adaptation, these are two sides of a coin. You can't do away with one. You need to do both. Uh, you just cannot ignore one and then say, OK, no, no, we will wait for uh, uh, the developed countries to kind of uh, cut down their emissions and then maybe we will start thinking about it. That's not going to happen because uh, as we are witnessing, uh, every year, year after year, and this year, of course, there's been an enormous amount of 
uh, reporting also. I mean, I, here I would like to bring in the the media houses also. You know, the way you know the entire reporting has changed. You know, the issues are highlighted. So, which means people are becoming more aware. So let's let's just accept the fact that yes, all of us are cognizant of it. So yes, the first step towards action is recognizing that there is a problem, which I think we have as a country, as individuals also by and large. Now the next step is towards action. So obviously to moot action at the high level, of course you need policies, uh, so on and so forth. But at the same time, it also needs to be bottom up. The kind of things that Seema spoke about, you know, uh, we making a conscious decision as to saying no to certain things, but then trying to kind of bring forth that change. So the, the kind of action uh, that could be mooted could be twofold. It can be top down or bottom up, whatever that is. Uh, but whenever we're talking about adaptation, the interesting part, uh, uh, angle or dimension to that is that adaptation is kind of, you know, it's local. While uh, we talk about uh, climate change as a problem, as a global issue, adaptation is like, uh, you know, more local, primarily because the kind of uh, uh, complexities that come in when we, whenever we talk about climate sensitive sectors. So when I say climate sensitive sectors, we're talking about agriculture, we're talking about forestry, or even, uh, you know, we're talking about the coastal uh, infrastructure also for that matter. So all of these are, you know, uh, you know, these are diverse in nature. Think about India. Uh, I, I still remember the 2015 Economist, one of the, uh, you know, uh, issues which said that India kind of, you know, hides behind or masks itself. Uh, it's as large as almost a continent, but then it's actually a country. Uh, but then there are the, the kind of diversity that's there is very, very large out there. So given this diversity, obviously the action has to be, there is no one single solution. You can't go in with a blanket approach out here, which is where, you know, the kind of uh, uh, information that Arunaba spoke about, you know, how many districts are going to be the hotspots, how many are going to be vulnerable, which are the ones that are at risk, these all come into play because it's not uniform. That's because of the, uh, the, the kind of varied climate profile that a country like India has. We, we have the Western Ghat, which is a biodiversity hotspot. You have the Northeastern India. You also have the agricultural belt, Central India. You have a long coastline and you have fisheries and a whole lot of other uh, uh, sectors which are dependent, the economies are dependent on the, the coast and whatever happens out there. So now you cannot give the single solution. So which is why, you know, we need this kind of fi fine granular information on what are the changes that's happening. Now, of course, uh, we've been hiding behind uh, the fact that, uh, yes, there is a problem, but then uh, we don't have enough uh, evidence or science that can support decision making. But I think science has evolved quite a bit and we are kind of, you know, becoming more and more uh, evolve with the respect to the kind of information that's there, which can help definitely decision making. So obviously, uh, access to data still remains a challenge, of course, when we are talking about extremely localized kind of decision making. But by and large, uh, I would say, uh, uh, and I think uh, probably uh, it was Ashish or uh, Seema, I, I kind of uh, miss who said this, but then they spoke about the SDGs. Now, the interesting or the beauty of this is uh, you know, when you look at the SDGs, you, you action in one sector is going to kind of, uh, you know, influence others as well. So climate action is one of the things. But then, you know, if you look at climate action, why are we doing climate action? Why do we need to do something? A, because, you know, we need to conserve our resources, which obviously is another SDG as well. Uh, whenever we're talking about conserving uh, the agricultural yield and productivity, that's again to do with ensuring that the farmers have a certain income. So that's again, reflecting on the economy. So these are finely interlinked, uh, you know, kind of uh, issues out there. So I think when we look at it with through different lens, then we have a problem. But then the important thing is to kind of look at it through the problem with a single lens, which is to ensure, uh, you know, well-being of a society, of the environment then all of it falls in place. Uh, and I think I will stop here. My time is up and we could uh, discuss it further during the uh, open session, of course. Thank you.
Thanks, uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Murthy, for bringing in this perspective, the larger developmental perspective, but also with the focus on adaptation uh, issues. Uh, I would uh, hand over back to Monmi because I think we have a couple of students here who would like to raise questions, pose questions to you, uh, all of you. So Monmi, please, uh, or Taru, sorry, yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chaturvedi. Yes, we have two students who would be, uh, who have a couple of questions for the speakers and for you. Uh, inviting uh, Rayan Patak from St. Joseph College, Bangalore, and Ms. Deveshi Sharma, Mayo College Girls School, Jaipur. Please open your uh, cameras. Can we see you? Okay, uh, Rayan is there. Uh, Deveshi. All right, Rian, over to you. You can start. Meanwhile, I'll contact uh, Deveshi. Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, and thank you, sir, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, so my question to the distinguished panelists is that there has been a lot of emphasis on innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship in general uh, over this uh, over this time uh, with like schemes like Atmanirbha Bharat. So I want to gain your insight on how could like uh, budding entrepreneurs contribute to adaptation and mitigation schemes. Arnava, you want to start, then maybe Seema, and then uh, you could also have uh, Dr. Murthy stay in. Arnava, why don't you go first? There is, uh, uh, Ryan, thanks for a very important question. You know, when we think of the environmental challenges, we've, the problem we've had generally, historically, is that we've thought of growth as being driven by a certain type of activity that you have to mine materials and you have to put it in a polluting factory and you get a product. And then after the fact, some people will raise a hue and cry about, you know, well, the river is getting dirty or the air is getting polluted. So let's clean it up, right? So that is a very, what is called a sort of a linear approach towards environmental challenges. Now, the youth of today have to completely upend, you know, completely change that outlook. That it's not about grow first, pollute then, and then clean up later. It has to be, how do I deliver growth while reducing my environmental footprint, my resource footprint, and actually generate even more welfare and well-being, the, the word that uh, 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 Dr. Murthy uh, used. Now, where does technology then come in? You have to then think about what is what are the kinds of ways in which you can uh, either source material, transform material, transport material, or consume material, right? So sourcing material, say the traditional way is digging up more mines. Okay. Instead of digging up mines, can you build a business that has a circular economy of minerals from the smartphones, laptops, batteries, etc. Transforming material. Today you need coal to put in a steel, a steel blast furnace to make steel. Within 10 years, some of you will be just at the early stages of a career. Could we be using green hydrogen to make steel instead of using the coal transforming material? Transporting material. Do we need to transport material on ships that use some of the most polluting fuels? Or could we be using green ammonia? Do we need to transport at all? Or can we bring technology closer to points of consumption? Right? Reduce mobility needs, your footprint goes down. And finally, consuming material, right? which goes back to the circular economy of consumption. Why do we need to own a car? Why cannot we hire not just an Uber, but hire the services that a vehicle provides. 90% of the time, a car is immobile. 90% of its life, it is immobile. It just sits. So can we go from product to service? Each of these things is a way of innovating the technology and the business model in sourcing, transforming, transporting, and consuming materials. Right? 
and each of these offers opportunity to drive new technology and businesses. Thanks. Uh, Pima, please. Not much to add. I just think that, you know, um, entrepreneurs uh, and uh, people who are interested in building new on enterprises have a huge opportunity, as Ar Arunaba was saying, to look completely differently. And uh, to look at, uh, you know, one, as he was saying, completely, uh, you know, uh, move away from the usual uh, uh, thinking about uh, how do you actually have growth, development, and economic gains. But it's also looking at the challenges that we are facing today. How do you come up with innovative solutions? And those innovative solutions also have to ensure that you don't create another problem. Many times the traditional uh, uh, way of thinking has led to solving one problem and creating a new problem, right? So you solve a problem of, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's say waste management, uh, but you make transform it into an air pollution problem. That isn't really solving the problem. So you really have to, um, I think, one of the main thing that now we have to think of is the interconnectedness of all these issues and interconnectedness of issues, interconnectedness of, uh, you know, uh, sectors of industry. So solve problems and bring out solutions for clusters of industry so that they can transform rather than doing it in a silo way. I think that's one thing that I'll add to what uh, Arunaba said. Thank you. Sure. Very interesting point, uh, Seema, that you make, uh, because I think this entire uh, sort of uh, thinking in systems so when you do policies when you do uh, innovation i think this is the the big sort of and a lot of people are thinking about it in terms of what is design thinking what is systems thinking uh, and that is going to be big business opportunity and big entrepreneurship opportunities as well uh, going forward and i think dr murti already mentioned it in the, in the when she was making a presentation on the interconnectedness of things please dr murti yeah, I think, uh, I think both Seema and Arunabha have very nicely articulated, you know, what had to be said. So I just wanted to kind of reiterate that, uh, you know, the way forward is uh, not to just come up with uh, businesses because, you know, everybody is doing it or, uh, you know, that's, that's the thing that's going to kind of do, uh, you know, something that uh, say mimic the West, as they say sometimes, uh, but not necessarily that, but then trying to look at the problem in its entirety and also uh, bringing in the systems thinking is what would actually play out very well indeed uh, for instance you know in 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 the in the adaptation language you know we always try to look at the problem from the lens of what makes it vulnerable so what is driving the vulnerability so the drivers of change need to be very clearly in place before you come up with a solution and it should not be short sighted it, it, it should have different phases you know okay within this time period what is it that we're trying to do and then slide you know it's it has to be a telescopic way of looking at the problem because you know what is good today may not be something that's going to be good enough tomorrow with the kind of changes that are playing out so very fast than what we had seen in the past. So yes, that's all I would say. Thanks, uh, thanks. Uh, I hope Ryan, you got substantive uh, answers to what you were looking for. Uh, and uh, yes, so you can chew on uh, that for a while while we move on to Devishi. Devishi is also online now. Please Devishi, go ahead. Um, good evening, your excellencies, distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Deshi Sharma, a student of class 8 from Mayo College Girls School, Ashmer. It is my honor and privilege to ask a question on a platform as prestigious as the Youth Climate Conclave. So my question is, during the COP26, Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi promised the world that India will achieve net zero emission target by 2070. What, according to you, will be the key elements of a roadmap for the country? Maybe I think uh, I will change the order now. Arunaba, you come at the end. Uh, so let's start with uh, Dr. Murthy and then we go to Seema, you retain your spot and then we come to Arunaba. Thanks, thanks, Ashish. So, uh, yes, the roadmap, you know, there could be multiple pathways of achieving it. One way to look at is, you know, given the existing technologies, how do we arrive there? But then there's a lot of innovation that's already happening, right? So 
obviously, you know, one could also kind of consider all these, you know, on the anvil kind of uh, technologies as well, and then try and see. So uh, there is no one single pathway to achieve net zero. And also whenever, you know, in the modeling communities, that's why we always talk about multiple scenarios to arrive at a destination. The same goes to real life also, you know, if you have to reach from point A to point B, uh, you know, you either take the shortest route or you take the route which has the least traffic or you kind of take the route which is traveled most by most people. So, you know, there are different ways of arriving at net zero. However, I think what would actually determine what comes in would be uh, a the maturity of the technologies that exist in the first place. And secondly, the costing of these, you know, how how much is it going to cost? How much is it? that would be required at different points in time, because all of it cannot kick in in a one single time. So obviously the way it's going to be phased, uh, phased over a period of time and also looking at how much is available at what point. So that's what is going to be determining uh, which is going to play out, how it's going to play out as we move from now towards say 2070. And of course, we have to be also remembering that when we say net zero in 2070, it's not like you wait for 2070 for it to happen. It has to kind of a, be a very gradual shift, transition. That's what uh, I think the previous panel was also talking about, you know, transition. How do you achieve it? Uh, so that's something that every one of us need to be uh, keeping in mind. I think um, the best person to answer actually is Arunabha, but I will because they have done some work on this. I know. I just think uh, in in my view on this really is that um, while net zero at twenty seventy is a very good target, uh, we need to really break it down and look at near term aspirations and near term goals. The way to achieve anything, as we know in life, is to have uh, time bound uh, plans and goals. So it goes for our personal plans, our professional plans. And so I think it also goes for a countrywide plan that we a goal that we have. So I would think that, you know, we need to have, um, let's say 2025, 2030, 2040, these kind of targets. And I know that uh, the go government has also in the announcement mentioned some uh, near term, you know, targets as well. The most important thing will be to, uh, you know, really get our policy framework and the policy direction correct and put us on that path, right? Unless we do that. So I think the single uh, most important step that we need to take to begin this journey is to get our policy direction correct. And I think, again, a lot has been written that what needs to be done to actually do, put us on that path. Uh, it's a matter of now really making that happen. So one of the dangers of having a 2070 um, kind of a goal is the relaxed feeling we have that it's so far away and we can, you know, take our time. But we know this is, if anything, we don't have is this time in the case of climate crisis. We need to really put ourselves as a nation, as a society, as individuals, as each company, put ourselves on that path now, right? And that's the single most important uh, piece, I think. And that intent has been put, but let's start the action now. And after that, work on the building blocks of finance, technology, different sectors. You know, there are so ways to cut this cake, so many ways to cut this cake. But we know how to do that. If we put that single important thing of the policy intent being very clearly put out there. So that is what I feel. Thank you. Please. You know, recently I was reading a book um, called, uh, it's called, a lion tracker's guide to life. It's a thin book. You can also pick it up and read it. It's not very complex. In that, so the, the book is written by a, a white South African who has a mentor as a black South African who teaches them how to track lions and in the process learn about nature, but in also in the process learn about life. So his black South African mentor says one day, and he's not gone to school, college, etc. He's just basically grown up in nature and his life's wisdom comes from there. He says, I don't know where I'm going, but I know exactly how to get there. Now, that really is the mantra that must guide India over the course of the next 50 years. 
and people like you will be guiding India over the course of the next 50 years. We don't know exactly where we are going because as Dr. Murthy said, there will be multiple paths towards that final destination. But I know exactly how to get there. That is the how, not the what. That is the how I was talking about, right? What Seema was talking about, that we need a legislative and regulatory clarity. We need, as Ryan's question asked, we need an ecosystem where innovation flourishes, right? We need to be able to give signals that, look, we want to transform our how we move, how we transport ourselves and goods. That's a signal. Now, how we actually get there will be multiple paths. It could be electric vehicles. It could be hydrogen fuel cells. It could be something completely different. How we make things in steel or cement or t-shirts will change, right? But it's very important that we don't lock ourselves into technologies we know today but we open our minds to ways to get there. Um, when the Congress party was created in 1885, we didn't know we would get independence in 1947. But the how was what was experimented. You can petition, you can protest, you can form parallel governments, etc. But we knew exactly how to get there in terms of, yes, a nonviolent method, uh, engaging with the powers that be and upturning that power structure. 30 years ago, India, I was a teenager at that time, India went through a economic crisis where our gold had to be shipped out in order to get loans. And we kicked off our economic reforms. We didn't know exactly what we would end up being 30 years later as an economy. We didn't know we would become a $3 trillion economy. So 30 years later, can we have green reforms that 50 years from now, we have a completely transformed economy. So I'm giving you the, the elements of this, this transformation will be electricity, transport, industry, agriculture, etc. But like that South African mentor of that of the author of a lion tracker's guide to life. You don't know exactly where you're going, but you don't know exactly how to get there. So figure it out. Thanks. Uh, let's go back to uh, Taru because I think we're really running out of time. Of course, fascinating discussions and fascinating interaction, but I think Taru's getting nervous. So please. <laughs> you actually caught my pulse, Dr. Chaturvedi. <laughs> So thank you so much, uh, all the speakers and uh, to Dr. Chaturvedi to, to give such interesting nuances of the subject. It was a pleasure to have all of you uh, at YCC uh, 2022. And thank you to the students for moderating the interview questions. I hope you are answered well and very comprehensively. Uh, we move on to the next uh, section of the session wherein we have a video message from uh, Mr. Mahendra Singhi. MD and CEO Dalmia Simmons Limited. Uh, program sir, could I request you to play the video, please? Thank you. Greetings to young climate leaders. Namaskar. Many times it is said to build a future for our youth, but it is other way around. Youth make our future. Your dreams can change the course of the nations and the societies. You can resolve crises and can also amplify them with ignorance or can turn it into opportunities. Climate crisis is already unfolding on societies nations, economies, agriculture, and the environment. Naturally, this is connected to present and the future. But the good part is that you can solve this crisis too. I ask this question that if not you, who else can solve the ongoing and intensifying crisis like climate change? The reason 
why I believe you can solve climate crisis is very simple. You are the fountain of innovation, hard work, ambitions, creativity, and collaborations. Your collaborations on social media are becoming stronger every day. You have the power of choosing the right leaders and delivering the right future leadership. You are a connecting link between the past, present, and the future. The strengths like these are good enough to fight any crisis humanity would face. The larger question is, will you take part in this fight with your collective strength? And when we see programs like Youth Climate Conclave, or Climate Jambore, or United Nations Youth Climate Summit, or many such programs world over, it gives me confidence that youth is prepared more than ever. You are aware on environmental conservation, taking steps to curb plastic pollution, consider tea plantations, reduce water consumption, and use energy efficient appliances. Your actions are now delivering results across the globe. Your engagement on World Environment or Earth Day are giving phenomenal saving results. Now, friends, world leaders are hearing you more than ever. Today, they think of youth voice before taking any decision. It highlights how important your participation has become in the global decision making. My message to you all, use this immense collaborative innovative and collective power to solve climate change. Take actions yourself and compel others to take climate actions by adoption of sustainable lifestyle, vegetarianism, promotion of green products purchase, scientific waste disposal methods, and political to tape policies. Besides, innovate to solve problems around you and collaborate to raise your collective voice. My dear young friends, we are ready to hear you. We are prepared to collaborate with you. We are certainly looking for your climate leadership. Your partnership makes our thinking process younger and resilient to shape a better future. And friends, this is what I share with my grandchildren, Navya, Naisha, and Nivan. Finally, I want you to believe what is written behind the wall. This is said by our Swami Vivekanandji. All power is within you. You can do anything and everything. That was Mr. Mahindra Singhi from Dalmia Cement. Uh, we now move on to our next speaker. Uh, she is Ms. Shakti Ramkumar, uh, another youth speaker who represented the country in Milan at COP26. Uh, over to you, Shakti. And thank you for joining in today. Ms. Mehta, it's an honor to join you in the event today, and I've really appreciated learning from the other speakers. So my name is Shakti Ramkumar. And I'm the Director of Communications and Policy at Student Energy. So Student Energy, we are a global youth-led organization and a nonprofit working with 50,000 young people from over 120 countries. Um, and as a civil society organization, our goal is to empower young people with the specific skills, networks, and mentorship that we need to be able to take action to address the climate crisis. Um, we have over 40 university chapters around the world. We host the largest student-led energy conference in the world, and we also run many completely free energy education and skill building programs for young people who want to start careers in the energy sector or who want to launch their own community projects. So today I'll share some of those projects um, because I saw many comments in the chat about how youth can get involved. Um, and I hope that you'll get involved too. Feel free to find me on LinkedIn or send me an email. I'm always here to kind of help uh, get started. Um, but first I'll share a couple of the um, insights that I witnessed from participating in the Youth for Climate Summit in Milan and COP26 in Glasgow. 
And although the sum of the nationally determined contributions were not what we were hoping for, I did feel deeply inspired by the leadership that was shown by young people and by grassroots climate activists at these events. So there were three themes that I think really stood out to me from these conferences. Um, one is that youth advocates are not ready to settle for solutions that might lock us into the unsustainable technologies for decades or solutions that may reduce emissions, but don't reduce uh, the inequality between countries and within countries. Um, young people aren't willing to settle for those kinds of half measures, which was a promising sign for me. And it was also clear that young people are looking for engagement beyond consultation. So not just um, kind of being consulted every now and then, but being involved actively as equal partners in developing and carrying out policies in community organizing uh, in upskilling. Um, it's clear that youth really want to be involved. And finally, it was also clear that young people recognize the need to invest in the solutions that we already have and scale them to move away from fossil fuels and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we can't afford any more inaction, delay on climate action, or waiting on the promise of new technologies. So those three uh, trends noticed at the conference were really a positive sign for me. Um, but I'll share a couple of the projects that I'm hoping that young people will get involved in. Um, the first is called the Global Youth Energy Outlook. So this is a first of its kind report that gathers the perspectives of 42,000 young people from over 132 countries on what they want to see for the future of energy in their region. So we shared the initial findings at COP26, and you can find them too at studentenergyoutlook.org. And then soon we will be turning it into action toolkits. Um, we hope that the Global Youth Energy Outlook can be a powerful data-backed advocacy tool for young people um, to advocate for bold climate action at the local level, at national levels, and at international levels. And we also hope that the report will be a tool for decision makers to understand. The second project that I want to share with you is called Student Energy Ventures. So Ventures is a new program actually launching just today. Um, it's a direct to youth funding model that breaks down traditional barriers to clean energy entrepreneurship and project development. So Student Energy Ventures aims to reduce barriers to clean energy by providing access to funding, mentorship, project development templates um, for youth to launch their community energy projects. Um, and we hope that Ventures gives a cohort of young people the important early career experiences that we need to become lifelong problem solvers, and it's open to youth from all over the world. So we particularly encourage youth who uh, to apply who have not yet had an experience in project management or who want to start an energy career but haven't done so yet. Uh, regardless of what discipline they're studying, we, we encourage you to apply. So uh, those two projects I shared, of course, are just two of the many, many ways that they could be a starting point. So I invite the young people um, watching today, my fellow youth and uh, fellow speakers to join us. Um, feel, please feel free to send me an email. It's just my first name, Shakti at studentenergy.org or find me on LinkedIn, visit our website and I'd be happy to share more information if I can. Thank you very much. Thank you Shakti for your inputs. Uh, moving on, uh, National Green Crops, probably, uh, popularly known as a program of eco clubs, initiated nationwide by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Government of India. The program has school children at the vanguard of a campaign to green the earth. In this particular section, we have uh, Gujarat State Nodal Agency for Eco Club Activities. We have our guest uh, for the evening, Mr. Alap, Alap Pandit, Program Officer, Green Foundation, Gujarat and and there are also youth representatives from NV Patel Science College uh, Anand and uh, Labubai Trivedi Engineering Col College Rajput. Over to you, Mr. Pandit. Uh, thank you so much. Am I audible? Clear enough? Yes, sir. Okay. Can I uh, share the presentation over here? Sure.
is it visible can you please let me know yes sir and would be helpful if you can do the slide show is it okay now yeah okay now uh thank you so much and uh, thanks for giving the opportunity to be the part of uh, uh, this event uh, and our uh, uh, the presentation of our topic is the to elaborate the role of eco clubs and more specifically what eco clubs do under the national green corps program which is the pilot and flagship program of ministry of environment forest and climate change and uh, with respect to the ecological education or environment education division of the ministry uh, well quickly uh, we'll take you uh, through the presentation uh, not wasting time uh, basically uh, because i have few minutes and i have to uh, uh, now hand over to the students i have with us from the nv patel science college and labubai trivedi engineering college well basically uh, we encourage the eco clubs uh, as i say the role of uh, nodal agency uh, to encourage the eco clubs to take up such activities which inculcate <clears throat> and impart ecological education among students uh, starting from the kindergarten level or maybe the primary level up to the college level uh, so up to the youth level and you can see here that the various kinds of activities been taken over and carried out by the eco clubs schools uh, in various manners including uh, building the small nurseries at school developing eco friendly uh, idols uh, celebrate, celebrating various ecological days including some of the indian festivals like rakhi festival and tying rakhi to the trees and plants in their school to get them connect and uh, to show the attachment they have with the trees and plants uh, they grow in the school itself uh, you can see here for a few photographs of plantation activities and all uh, apart from that we encourage them to uh, become uh, the voice for the mass and that could be uh, like through playing street uh, street plays uh, organizing various uh, events including locals uh, and that sort of thing uh you can see here we also encourage them to carry out you know uh, swastha abhiyan cleanliness drives and awareness drives in and around uh, schools nearby schools and also we facilitate them if they want to carry out uh, this kind of activities in any any protected areas and we can also help them then they could uh, go there and uh, do the cleanliness drives you can see here a few photographs of beach cleaning exercises Uh, plantation exercises and all being carried out by the eco club students uh, these are few more photographs uh, and uh, uh, we also carry out a few educational activities like educational camps nature education camps at various places in gujarat in fact gujarat forest department is very active in that activity and on an average uh, the department carries out about 1000 nature education camps which facilitate about uh 50000 students including uh, teachers and students to take up the opportunity to study various ecological components uh by physical observations and their their personal observations and which helps them to understand the environment in a better way uh now i uh, hand over this presentation uh, i invite uh, shruti jagani and mohak batnagar from nv patel a science college to take over from here shruti and mohak can you hear me yes sir yes sir we can hear okay so you can carry on forward from here if you want you can ask me to change the slide okay sure, sir Okay, kindly please uh, please speak about the various activities that you do uh, in your college. Uh, 
Hello. Are the students there? Or sir, maybe uh, you can only continue because. Uh, Hello. Am uh, I uh, Yes, yes, please speak. Uh, Hello. Hello, am I uh, audible? Yes, you are audible. Please go ahead and open your video if you can. Yeah, sure, ma'am. Um, uh, so, uh, extremely sorry for the interruption. There were some network issues going on. <laughs> so, hello everyone. So, thank you so much for uh, giving uh, the youth this opportunity to speak here. Myself, Mohak Bhatnagar, I am a member of uh, Eco Club at Natubai B. Patel College of Pure and Applied Science. We, throughout the year, organize activities at our campus to sensitize the youth about non -love. Hello? Yes, yes, carry on. You are very much audible and please continue. Uh, so we at our campus keep on organizing activities throughout the year uh, to promote and uh, sensitize students towards the phenomena of climate change. So global learning and observation for benefit of uh, environment popularly called as GLOBE, is a worldwide platform which provides students with opportunity to participate in data collection for meaningful understanding of Earth system and GLOBE environment. We recently organized a workshop at GIR Foundation, where our Echo Cup coordinator, Dr. Sushmita Sahu Ma'am, participated and which was about how parameters of climate change affect the environment around us. After learning a lot of facts, we implemented the same in our college and uh, we uh, students along with uh, all other students uh, uh, took the temperatures daily, uh, day and night uh, in the Charotar regions. And uh, here at Charotar, we are blessed with a number of wetlands. And wetlands play a very important role over here. Uh, we host a number of migratory species that come throughout the year. But the recent uh, trend of uh, cli due to climate change, we have seen that uh, uh, these species are uh, no more coming over here to make uh, it uh, as their migratory homes. So uh, we, when we saw this, we conducted a lot of research at our campus. We even organized World uh, uh, Wetland Day celebrations in order to uh, sensitize uh, our youth and people in general about how wetlands are playing a very important role uh, in uh, this region and wetlands are the heart of Charutar region. So it is important for us to understand. Apart from this, we have also conducted a lot of seminars, webinars, etc. Uh, because of uh, COVID constriction, uh, we could not meet much at the college or else we would also have organized a lot of uh, meet. Uh, however, we have also uh, conducted lots of uh, uh, seminars online where uh, a number of panelists have uh, came forward uh, uh, giving us idea about uh, how sustainability can play an important role and uh, how it is important for us as youths to uh, take actively part in this uh, phenomena and do something for our nation. Uh, as stated by uh, Nilesh Kumar sir, that huge chunk of our population uh, consists of youth and uh, as youth, we are the future. So we cannot correct the mistakes that we have uh, done in the past, but there's always space for hope. Therefore, uh, tackling climate change should be our primary goal and for the betterment of the future generation and the climate change in general. It is high time that instead of solely discussing the ideas, we act now, take firm actions because our actions are going to determine our future. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Mohak. Uh, and uh, I also have with uh, uh, us Harsh and Jay from Labubai Trivedi Engineering mm -hmm. College. I request Harsh and Jay to take over from here. So this is Shruti. Am I audible? Uh, yes. Yes, Shruti. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, so. 
A very good evening to everyone present over here, the distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen. I am Shruti Jagani, the Eco Club Secretary of NV Patil College of Pure and Applied Sciences. So, as spoken by the Secretary General of UN, Mr. Antonio Guterres, moments of great difficulty are the moments of great opportunity as well. So today we are in the time of great difficulty and we must all come together in solidarity and work to tackle the issue of climate change, other various problems human race is facing today and to move forward with hope for people, planet and prosperity. So the Eco Club of NV Patil College has organized various activities that addresses the issue of climate change, its direct and indirect effects sustainability and other nature related issues so here are the few activities that our college conducted the first one is international tigers day celebration so the international tigers day is celebrated on july 29th every year to raise the awareness about the conservation of wild cats now tiger population being very important for the ecological balance which over the past 150 years has faced a massive drop in the population. Now, what are the reasons for this population drop? So, most of the declining tiger population are threatened primarily by the habitat loss due to several anthropogenic factors, climate change included, and poaching as well. So, on the occasion of International World Tigers Day celebration, various competitions like youth parliament on the topic human interference in the habitat zone of tigers was conducted poster making on the topic tiger conservation was also conducted the next activity is the faculty of environmental and biological sciences organized a certificate course on the topic organic farming and as a part of the program, the students visited an organic farm owned and maintained by one of the most renowned and respected agronomists, Mr. Sarvadhaman Patel. We saw how sustainable agriculture and biodynamic agriculture is practiced and how organic farming can be practiced without sacrificing the productivity. Eco Club of NV Patel College organized one Mahotsav in the college campus inviting guests from the Gear Foundation for the celebration. Plants of various varieties were planted in the campus by obtaining them from the Forest Department Nursery of Anand Gujarat. Students participated in a radio program that was organized by Gear Foundation and they delivered, the, they delivered a speech on the importance of forest conservation and why the forest, uh, why the one Mahotsav is celebrated every year. Now, what I believe is that more than 28% of the population of India are aged between the age of, is grouped between the age of 15 and 30 years, making the huge chunk we must work together for the betterment of not only this generation, but also the coming generations. Every human has a right to clean, healthy and resource rich society. And the only way to achieve these goals is by sustainability. We need the combination of existing technology, innovations, policies with the traditional knowledge system to achieve the various goals for sustainability. From what I figured is that a slow, conscious and simple living is the answer. It is definitely very difficult to transition from the world of convenience to Sorry, it is difficult to transition from the world of convenience to the one with the conscience, but a lot has been done, but a lot more needs to be done. And what I figured is that one step at a time helps if you are willing. And like one of the co-hosts and the faculty member of Terry said, the charity begins at home. We must start at home. Thank you. Thank you so much. You rightly mentioned that the problem is global, but the action should be local and it will yes. lead the uh, global uh, change. And uh, we should start the change from within us. Uh, now I request Harsh and Jay to take over from here and uh, say a few things about the, the activities they carry out in their college. Jay and Harsh. Hello, am I audible? Yes, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, 
myself jay sondagar representing sltti tico club i am glad to have a chance to be the part of the club as well as this meeting our college sri labubai trivedi institute of engineering and technology is not just only institute of engineering it is a institute of engineers with values the values to use our brain and power to serve the society and nature our college sltit have joined eco club in 2018 but even before joining our college was doing activities to conserve nature including creative and distributing uh, paper bags for plastic free campaign in which we have distributed more than 15000 paper bags to bring awareness in society about the least use of plastic we have planned a tree plantation drive as well as cleanliness drive too in which we have received a lot of uh, self participation from the students in 2019 under the banner of ubi and eco club we have planned learning and awareness activity of solar energy in which more than 175 students have assembled the solar lamps on the occasion of 2nd october in 2020 we have started planting herbal medicinal plants and have planted more than 1500 plants in our 10 acre green campus as well as we we are doing our best to rescue the animals under our premises by the help of ngos under the eco club our college sltit have created a value in the students to do and lead natural conservational activities and to make them morally responsible for the society and nature and will continue to do so hand over to uh, hers hello am i audible Yes, Harsh. Please continue. Okay. So, hello everyone. Myself, Harsh Chawda. I am here beside you to give information about work done by our college, Sri Labubai Trivedi Institute of Engineering and Technology under Eco Club. Aim of our Eco Club is to empower students to participate and take up meaningful environmental activities and our project. Today, I will tell you about two events and about wastage garbage ports. into sparrow houses and tree gardens in two plastic bottles okay sir firstly i am telling you about wastage garba ports event in 2017 26 students transformed garba ports into sparrow houses without any use of machine 26 students made 500 sparrow houses within 13 hours in 2018 300 to 400 students made 10051 sparrow houses from garba ports in 20 hours and our institute and college made world record and got recorded in limca book of records sir can you please change this slide yes sir next slide okay now sir so, uh, okay so in 2020 we made tree guards from wasted plastic bottles we made a successful prototype of it and even got support from rmc our product costs 400 to 500 rupees in small scale but if we scale up this product costs would be much lower than that at last i would like to thank everyone who helped us to achieve these goals and let us participate in betterment of our environment and society thank you all for your time Thank you so much, uh, Shruti, Mohak, Harsh, and Jay for joining with uh, me on this occasion. And this is all about the eco club activities in the state being carried out by various eco clubs and our basic role uh, to encourage them to take over more and more activities, which you know, uh, which transforms the uh, real perspective of education in the society. Uh, we as an gear foundation encourage all the students support all the students and support all the activities and uh, eco clubs in the state uh, so that they can uh, be the change and start the chain of a change by themselves thank you so much uh, thank you mr pandit for your inputs and thank you to all the students for joining in uh, we will conclude the day with the last uh, remarks the closing remarks from uh, 
uh, Mr. Jay Kumar Gaurav, Senior Advisor, Climate Change, GIZ India. Over to you, Jay, and thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Taru. And uh, um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, today and the moderators. We had very interesting sessions, and uh, the uh, it it was almost like a debate in the uh, in the first technical session. Uh, the address by uh, uh, our joint secretaries uh, from Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change by the ambassadors uh, from EU and it, and Italy was very inspiring. And uh, the uh, the last technical session also had uh, very good interventions as well as questions from the students and uh, response from the speakers about uh, um, about, about net zero and uh, how we can become a more uh, sustainable uh, society on the whole. So uh, we have we are looking forward to your participation tomorrow as well. Uh, because this is a two-day event and we have uh, lined up very interesting sessions uh, tomorrow uh, including two debate sessions where uh, the youth uh, participants will be divided in groups and they'll be debating on uh, interesting topics so uh, with this i would like to close the event for today and look forward to uh, your participation tomorrow uh, thank you everyone for joining Thank you, Jay. So we close for today and please join back tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. sharp. Thank you so much for your participation.